I, yeah, I've, no one's ever managed to come up with a good nickname for me. So it's all you. Yeah, it's all me. Okay, it's let's, your money. Yeah, let's let's uh <laughs> let let's get the chat in here. We need a good we got, we need a good nickname. I put something up the other day. I said uh, trail blazing, eyebrow raising. That's what I said. Bobby Swarbrick. You should work in advertising. I should. It's amazing. <laughs> because that reaction you gave on that um on that oh man, I can't remember what the show was when you were just like, what the fuck is this? Oh, what the fuck that was, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, like it's real funny because I got a bunch of acting mates, right? And they were like, You broke the fourth wall. And I was like, I what? I thought it was like a Seinfeld thing. Like <laughs> look at the camera and you're like, is this for real? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was during a debate on um cannabis reform when uh, a member of the opposition said uh that they were doing opposition for opposition's sake and then they said that we need to stop cannabis being imported and i was like where, okay. where from <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> no cannabis that is consumed and right. aotearoa is grown here my friends yeah, yeah. it's uh unless uh you know uh rangi toto is a uh, an international uh uh, agent, then no, it is not important. I don't think Northland counts as a different country. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Anyway, how are you? Oh, bro, I'm all good. I'm all good. Lockdown what? has been, yeah, rough. Um, <sighs> it's especially for the small businesses, um, you know, that I've been helping to support over last lockdown. There were a ton of them, um, particularly in the central city, that had. Some of them had great landlords, some of them had pretty awful landlords and uh, in commercial tenancies, just holding the um, personal guarantees over their heads to kind of exploit and squeeze as much money out of them during a freaking global pandemic as possible. And things have just been like, have you noticed like this election more than any that you've kind of like, I don't know, it's not like you've taken it. It's not like you've done it on purpose, but a lot of, a lot of people know you now, you know? It's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> It's not, I mean, yeah, we were kind of talking about it before um, we came onto the show, eh? but it's like, simultaneously, um, I want everyone to recognise that if I can come into Parliament, then that means anybody can, you know, high school dropout, swears too much, has tattoos, like that's, you know, the person who shouldn't be in Parliament and doesn't look like they should be in Parliament. But then the flip side of it is um, recognising that, you know, with the privilege of a platform, you have the opportunity to reach out to so many more people than if you're just kind of screaming into the void. So rage against the machine but do it with a platform <laughs> I, like that. I like that see that's like yeah even just getting into um politics you know it is quite a i don't know like a lot of people just don't do it because they either they don't know how or they just kind of like think nah that's uh, fuck that's for that's for privileged white people like you oh, know? yeah and then there's the people who are like i got skeletons in my closet and i'm like that's the problem i mean you think about um, in the last Australian election that they had um, more than like around 25 candidates from all across the political spectrum had to uh, pull out from the race because of dumb stuff that they said in the past on social media. Don't get me wrong, not excusing people having awful views or oppressing other people or whatever, but at the end of the day, not recognizing that people can change 10 years on and if they are going to go through a process of reconciliation or whatever, like I think that particularly particularly with people growing up now uh, on the internet and all the dumb stuff that you do as you're growing up, uh, you need to have that space to reflect. But our political culture just doesn't, it isn't open to that. It isn't open to people changing their mind because that's characterized as like a flip-flop or whatever. Yeah. I think uh, more than any, especially in like with Black Lives Matter movement and things like that, there is more, there's more need now for diversity and there's more need for representation from any, every mm. walk of life, you know? Hard out. And people who have screwed up in the past as well, eh? Like, yeah. I find it real funny, particularly on the cannabis yarn, like, you have a majority of parliamentarians now because it's kind of kosher to admit that back in the day you maybe like inhaled uh, but didn't enjoy it. Uh, and now you have politicians who've admitted to doing that overseeing uh, law that criminalizes people for doing the same thing that they did. And I'm just like, how do you marry those two concepts and think that you're a decent person at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so more people who have um, who are willing to be straight up about how screwed up it is and whatever else. Cause it's that same kind of thing. Eh? We're like, uh, so like there's been some interesting dialogue after um, this doco came out, uh, kind of following where I'm at in politics over the past few months. And 
a whole bunch of people going, oh, you know, if you're going to have a pop about how politics is, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I'm like, why don't we put out the damn fire? Why is the mm. kitchen on fire? We That's need so to true. all calm down. We need to all put out the fire and get set on making some kai so that everybody gets fed, you know? Yeah. Instead, it's everybody running around like headless chickens and it's just not constructive. All right. So before this interview, Chloe, I said to you, this is going to be the, the greatest interview you've ever had. Okay. I'm ready. You, you ready? All right. Every single thing we're gonna go through, I'm gonna I'm gonna spit some spit some lyrics for you. If you oh, know okay. them, bring them on. Okay. This one is from <laughs> this is from Kanye from Homecoming. All right. He says, "Reach for the stars. If you fall, you'll land on the cloud." And I believe that is the 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 quote that we're gonna start your early days as just a just a just a just who you are and the importance of the word why. Because I think a lot of kids don't ask why, and I have a feeling you were the kid that asked why a lot. Uh, I was the most annoying and precocious kid. I, my um, old man uh, talks all the time about how when I was growing up, like just every single night he would be, my dad was a big time smoker. Um, he's now on the vapes. So good one for harm reduction. Uh, but all growing up, he'd sit out on the balcony out the back and he'd just be fanging darts and uh, having a beer or whatever. And then he'd get to this point of, um, I would come out and be like, hey, dad, so what's the meaning of life? Um, and just like little seven-year-old me every single damn night, um, just kind of trying to grapple with um, whatever was going on. I'm not sure if that point it was kind of trying to pinpoint that I felt a little bit uh, lost and like I wasn't a part of stuff. Like I later found out dad told me that he had adopted me and, and had kind of a rough spot uh, with <coughs> Bano and whatever. But then um, one of my earliest speeches that I ever remember doing, my first speech when I was at primary school, was about double standards between kids and adults. And I was like, why do I have a bedtime? Why doesn't dad have a bedtime? Why do I not get to choose what I'm going to eat? And, you know, dad gets to choose what he eats and all of these things about why is society constructed in this way? Yeah. I later went on to study philosophy. So, you know, so it goes. Yeah, because I think, like, that's – when did you figure out that it was like fuck a papa and, and, and the meaning of finding your, your genealogy was so important? Like it is so important to, to Maori and, uh, mm. and Pacifica as well. But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you, you went out and you found, um, you know, you, you went My out biological dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, for me, I don't know if it was something that uh, I necessarily learned in any meaningful way um, through formal education or whatever. Like I... I uh, went to a whole bunch of different primary schools because my parents were breaking up and I was um, bounced to uh, England for a bit, then went through Papua New Guinea and Port Moresby and then back to Aotearoa. Uh, and I then went to Royal Oak Intermediate, which I see as like one of the big um, foundational parts of uh, learning who I was, being one of the 10% of white kids <laughs> at that school and being like, yes, um, there is a real important lesson to learn in uh, cultural dominance um, and always being the dominant uh, kind of ethnicity in a room. Mm. Um, and yeah, for me, it was more than anything about trying to go, well, if I pinpoint these people, if I pinpoint my biological dad, then hey, presto, I should kind of like figure out who I am. I had these narratives that were like informed by you know, stupid Hollywood movies or whatever. Uh, and then I met my biological dad and I was like, yeah, nah, like this doesn't, I haven't figured it all out. There's not like these massive fireworks going off. I haven't come to the conclusion of my movie. I don't know what's going on. So um, I guess that for me, it's been a matter of kind of finding um, uh, Turanga Waiwai and um, a sense of place and connection inside broader community. Um, yeah. Because my my family are like mongrels. We just have so many, so many different parts. Like we've been adopted so many times over, so many half siblings um, come through like uh, Irish side, English, and then all of these different patchy bits all across New Zealand. So um, quite difficult to do the family tree, my friends. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Like, um... But you know it's important, like because I, uh, like I, I really um, understand that because I was the same. Like I wasn't, um, I just didn't know my dad, and then you know just trying to figure it out, and then you mm. know still on that journey. I have not met him, but um, one day, you know, hey, you never know. 
True. Well, you can go on one of those TV shows now, you know. My nana for ages was trying to get me to go on that TV, like missing pieces or whatever. And I was like, God forbid if I find my biological dad on TV and have to have the whole reaction and journey sure. like followed. I guess I live so much of my life now in this like weird kind of fishbowl. But back then it was way too much to contemplate it. But for you, you know, totally go for it. <laughs> no, I'm I'm gonna get famous and then I'm gonna be on TV and then I'll be like throwing little fingers like, yo, fucking look at me, but no, no, I wouldn't do that. Come through, dad. I miss you. <laughs> yeah, remember me. <laughs> me, motherfucker? No, 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 I want to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, and what what are some other contributing factors that, like you talked about your food, uh, you talked about your school. What are some contributing factors around, like, that made you who you are? Like, is there a teacher? Is there, like, a mentor or somebody that was like, yo, this is, yo, be true to who you are? Because I think that's what mm -hmm. reigns really true through in, in what you stand for. Yeah, I think, um, like, the traditional schooling system was definitely not uh, for me. Um, I, when I was in, like, intermediate and primary school, I was, like, yeah, you know, considered um, to a certain extent one of the, or actually I was originally um, in year two, put in the um, class for slow kids because I couldn't hold a pencil and I couldn't spell my last name um, or my first name but my last name was just like shambolic. Uh, I didn't realize until I got out of school that I had uh, dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia, but with numbers, but that does impact how you begin to formulate um, how words look and stuff in your head. So um, I learned to read way before I learned to write uh, and could kind of structure sentences and stuff. And I uh, then went to high school and I used to, at a certain point started rebelling and was like, I know that I can do the rote learning stuff, but um, it just feels dumb. Yeah. And it also just feels really not yeah. what uh, life is supposed to be like. Yeah. And, you know, as you're like 15, 16, I was already kicking off big time on um, kind of the depression train, but also just um, really trying to like fight outside that box. And I had got in out of zone into one of uh, the fancy, uh, not private public schools, but one of the Epsom. fancy ones. Yeah, Epsom Girls Grammar. Um, and I was just like, this is really weird. Like there's these uh, really fancy kids here who have access to all this stuff, could be going to a private school. Um, and just kind of uh, for becoming aware of stuff like different social classes, especially especially having come from um, you know a place like Royal Oak Intermediate where a ton of the kids come from old school Onihanga or um, like South Auckland um, and bus in every day, and just feeling really out of place and disjointed by that. So um, I decided that I wanted to completely leave school. Yeah. And I was originally just going to, I don't know, go and find work in retail or whatever. But I spent a lot of time talking to um, actually a drama teacher, Miss um, Druitt, who was amazing. Uh, and she was just like, oh, just like explore your options, see whatever's out there. So I was like looking at uh, how to get into uni if I dropped out and if that would be possible. <laughs> Uh, and I found this thing called discretionary entrance. And I was like, mean, I'll apply for that. Uh, I had to go and take it to my dean and explain to her what it was because she didn't believe I could get in there. Oh, and wow. I then had to have recommendations from five of my teachers and like get good grades and stuff. Coming from barely having scraped achieved and level one in CEA, had to gun for excellence in level two. So I had like all my ducks lined up. I was like, okay, this is what has to happen. If I'm going to get out of here, I'm going to leave school. I'm going to leave home and I'm just going to try survive. Uh, and I got bad recommendations, uh, recommendations. My media teacher was like, Chloe is uh, so immature. And like the, uh, I would not recommend that she goes to university, um, particularly early. Uh, my maths teacher was not a big fan. But my drama teacher, my English teacher, and uh, another teacher, which is a subject I can't remember, but they were all like, yeah, I see some potential in this kid. And the fact that they backed me and also spent that time with me outside of class to just like sit me down and be like, get your shit together <laughs> was really important and useful. But also having an adult in my life, you know, that could see a future outside of the boxes that we typically yeah. prescribe. That's, man, that's a great one. Have you got any other, did you go to, you went to Royal Intermediate, right? 
Have you, yeah, have, it's, have, that's my proudest uh, yeah. school. Yeah, I've yeah. now been, um, if we talk about music, bro, um, Jess B shot uh, a music video there um, on the netball courts, uh, oh, set it cool. off. And I feature alongside Suzanne Paul and Madeline Sami for a brief cameo uh, in that. <laughs> Man, look at that. Man. Back, so, bring it back to Royal Look. <laughs> yeah. did, did you have any, um, Miss Na was it Miss Nabi there? Mrs. Nabi was Nabi? my teacher. Yeah. Yo, did you have? Yeah. What's a good story about Mrs. Nabi? Uh the best story about Mrs. Nabi was um, when she was telling off my boy Bryson. Um, so, uh, Bryson and Vincent, uh, the first two artists that I ever created a art exhibition for, when I was like eighteen, had no idea what the hell I was doing. I um, bumped into them on Karangahape Road, and I was like, "What are you boys up to now?" And they were like, "Oh, we're thinking of going to art school." But our parents aren't really that into it. And I was like, man, cool. We'll prove them uh, to them that you can do this. So I was like, we'll get you an art show. And I was like, went home, had to Google how to put on an art show, found a gallery, um, found, you know, a liquor uh, kind of sponsor, uh, decided to start trying to sell their works to people, ended up selling one of their works um, to Sir James Wallace, who's like a prolific collector. But I first met those boys, um, I think in room 13 it was, uh, at Royal Oak Intermediate with Mrs. Nabi. And I remember speaking to that kind of culture shock moment for me as this Palangi kid. Uh, there was this moment where she was telling Bryson off because Bryson was not paying attention and we we're doing maths or something. Uh, and he was doodling on the back of his book. Those two were amazing artists from Day Dot. And uh, Bryce was just like looking down and Mrs. Nabi goes, um, uses it as a moment to teach the whole class. She goes, look, if I was, you know, a Pakia uh, teacher, I would see this response and I would go, that's a bad kid. Mm. And I would treat that as a sign of disrespect. And at that point in time, uh, it would become this kind of vendetta that I held against this kid because they're a bad kid. But I recognize that, you know, Bryson um, and his Pacifica um, kind of culture that he brings to this classroom, that is a sign of respect, not looking somebody in the eye when they're mm. telling you off. And that was just like this moment that this light bulb went off in my head and I came to realize how institutional racism, yeah. uh, even though I didn't know that's what the terminology was, but that's how that stuff plays out. Um, kids end up being defined by how they fit or don't fit into the perceivably dominant culture. And those things aren't necessarily immediately obvious, but if they don't gel with what people deem to be appropriate, even if it's like unconscious, um, then all of these biases end up playing out throughout the rest of their um, kind of education, right? And you have that experience from, um, the data out of, um, I can't remember where the study was, but uh, where teachers were told that this was a class of smart kids and this was a class of dumb kids. And basically the expectations that they ended up placing on those um, different classes of children ended up informing how those children achieved or succeeded or didn't, even though from a test case, they were both exactly the same level of academic potential. Yeah, I mean, we'll, I mean, we could get in, uh, we'll get into education uh, soon. Uh, but yeah, I could I could talk all day about education, and that's what we're gonna do. Um, anyway, next one, next lyric. Here we go. All right, it's how is this, this is the Frank Ocean one. All right, and I know you're on with me. Oh, with I this love one. Frank. It's hell on earth and the city's on fire. Inhale. You know the next, next one. <laughs> Inhale. And and how there's a heaven, right? Yeah. So I reckon like rise your rise in politics was kind of like was it really like holy fuck man like. This shit is fucking crazy. And, you know, like, okay, I just gotta in inhale a little bit. I just have to, like, there there's some fucking heaven somewhere here if I just keep to be myself and not try to change to be in the status quo. Like, wh what was, well, I mean, the first thing, like, getting, uh, I suppose, the confidence up to go, okay, cool, like, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to fucking go at this and be, a, a, be an MP. But, like, did you find that, like, the, your first kind of hit of it was just like, whoa, this is not even what I expected what it was, was going to be. 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny, eh? Because a lot of people nowadays hit me up uh, if they've just met me and they're like, wow, you're cynical. And I'm like, you should have met me four years ago. I was way more cynical back <laughs> then. If anything, um, I've kind of come to see uh, our potential for change, particularly if people uh, decide that they don't want to put up with this stuff anymore. So um, it was it was really out the gate first uh, coming into Parliament. Like, I was actually reflecting um, in a yarn with a mate earlier this week that I've never really properly taken a step back. And this could be a thing of like my coping mechanism, particularly with mental health stuff, where I'm always going like, hit the next thing, hit the next thing, hit the next thing, never taking a moment to reflect. Mm. And like, I never um, properly celebrated my graduation. I never properly, properly reflected and celebrated being elected. Um, so it, it's been a bizarre kind of blurred process of going, how does this fit in with the rest of my life now that I guess I'm uh, more mature and reflective at 26 years old. Um, but for me, it's um, kind of seeing that, uh, particularly on the imposter syndrome stuff that you kind of alluded to, like none of those jokers and myself included as one of the jokers know anything like everyone's just trying their best with the resources available to them you know like that moment where you grow up and you'll realize that your parents were making it up when they were raising you yeah. it's the same kind of thing getting into parliament and just going actually um if i do my research here and i really fight my corner like i'm just as legit as any of the other guys and i realized that through a process of debates more than anything because i realized that uh, given that I was always going to be put in this corner for being the young one in particular, that I would have to work harder to be seen as legit in this mm. space than somebody who was seen, you know, who was just like this random dude who walked in wearing a suit like you, bro. <laughs> this is, uh, hey, don't, uh, don't, don't ask me to stand up though. No, it's your windsuit. It's your windsuit. Yeah, I yeah, apologize. Don't ask me to stand up because there ain't no pants. <laughs> We're going straight on these on here, but uh, anyway, <laughs> but like, you know, what, what, did you ever get sick of them just going like, oh fuck, you just don't have any life experience? Because that was like a legit. That's all they fucking said, right? Oh, totally. But I mean, my favorite thing to do in response to that is just like, show me your cards, like. Where has your so-called life experience ever worked? <laughs> like, you haven't managed to sort out any of these problems. So I don't know if it's the life experience that's the issue here. It seems to be something else. Um, but also, you know, like, it's supposed to be a house of representatives. And by a house of representatives, you know, no one's questioning that we should have older people or middle-aged people there. But for some reason, people are like, oh, it's real out the gate and mad to have younger people there, even though they have a way longer timeline to think about for the potential ramifications of uh, the solutions or laws that are passed through the parliament. So for me, it's kind of been uh, just like trying to hit them back with like my life experience is actually growing up with the consequences of all of your decisions. So <laughs> I've got uh, some pretty good life experience on that. <laughs> yo, just that line there would fuck them up, yo. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah they don't like that. That's when they hang up on me, particularly oh. on talking radio, bro. <laughs> but I mean, like, like when you think about it though, like you, you said it, it's a house of representatives. Who's representing young people? Who's representing people of, uh, you know, like, don't get me wrong. We have the we have Maori seats. We have the, the the Maori party and stuff, but they've been conditioned too. Like, there's a little bit of conditioning going on there. To oh, like but they also have to operate inside of like a Westminster colonial system, exactly. you know. And like, this is the thing. So, um, good parallel is I was on all these panels um, about two years ago because I'm the like young woman, whatever. I fit the token box uh, to talk about 125 years since women's suffrage. And I was on these panels with like Helen Clark and Jenny Shipley and like all these women CEOs and stuff. And people were going, oh, we need more women on boards. We need more women in parliament. And I'm like, hold up. Why are we talking about wedging more women into these spaces that weren't necessarily designed for them? And I take the same approach to like Maori or Pacifica or younger mm. people inside our parliament. Like it wasn't made for them. It was like, it's an inherently colonial Westminster construct. And sure, you could argue that there are some beneficial things that you can learn from that, but primarily it is built on like violence and oppression. And it therefore serves to perpetuate some deeply adversarial approaches to decision making, which are pretty unhelpful. Well, I mean, like, what was the first taste of that toxic bullshit that you're fucking like? 
You know what I mean? Like you would have gone on there with, oh, yo, sweet, let's go to, and then you just saw something. You're like, that's some fucking ugly shit, you know? <laughs> I remember. Um, so like, I went in with eyes wide open, right? And I feel massively privileged to have never pretended to be anything that I'm not like you know people can say a lot of things about me but most of them are their interpretation of the reality mm. I've never held out a facade which as far as I'm concerned protects me a lot more than politicians who pretend to be something else like if you pretend to be perfect that's a big fall from grace so I remember uh, not too long ago actually and it happens every so often the chamber, the debating chamber, the stuff that you see on parliamentary TV is the worst side of humanity. Um, that stuff is not uh, in any way, shape or form a realistic representation of the debates and negotiations and attempts to uh, build consensus that happen behind the scenes. But it is some real dark theatre. Uh, and you just see, like, particularly this one got me big time a few months ago just after we'd had a, had a break after um, COVID-19 so we'd all gone into lockdown and then we'd come back to parliament and then there was this massive kickoff debate about uh, kind of benefits and about um, you know small businesses and the economy and all of these other things and uh, the Nets were just going off about basically poor people and about beneficiaries and using all of these really grotesque uh, old school kind of beneficiary bashing tactics. And I was just like, man, this isn't cool. This mm. is so awful. And these are the people who want to run the country. And it just really struck me in that moment as, you know, who looks at this place and goes, oh, that represents me. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> you know? I mean, like, it's, it's, a lot of them have like rose tinted glasses and the rose tint is just like, I need to, I, 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 yeah, it's a gang mentality almost. Like, you know, like, yo, I'm blues. Yo, I represent the blues, <laughs> G. Crips sees up. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, they'll say, like, you got to have some gumption, you know? You got to be like, nah, that shit ain't right. And some of those motherfuckers don't have that in them. They just go, oh, yeah, she said that I should say this. And then all of a sudden, it's like, bro, shut the fuck up. Like, that that, oh. that angers me, yo. Especially with the Yeah, I mean, there's, there's also this other um, thing, right, where I have seen, like, good example is the recent cannabis referendum, right? I know that there are politicians who are involved in parties that have effectively gagged them. And to me, that's just like, why did you get into this? Correct. Like, if you're not, if you're, if you're not willing to break party ranks on something that will stop people being arrested, that will stop kids being pushed into the shadows when they're experiencing harm. Like, when are you willing to use your voice? Because I think a ton of people manage to rationalize being involved in politics, keeping their head down, climbing up the ranks, because one day, one day, they'll be able to make a difference or whatever when they reach that point on the hierarchy. But the problem with that way of thinking is that you end up 10, 20 years down the track and you're so indoctrinated that you don't know what you believe in yeah. or think about anymore. Yes. So it's like, by that point, you've conformed so much. What's the point of you being there? Yeah. You get drunk on that, drunk on that success, success you know it's what I'm saying? It's that Kool-Aid. It's that Kool-Aid. It's that Vilema, girl. It's not the co It's that, the 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 <laughs> that Vilema. You know, <laughs> you get a couple of those Vilemas in you, mate. It's all on. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's that, it's that, uh, by any means necessary, climbing that fucking ladder, and then all of a sudden, you're too far up, and you can't come down, and then mm. that's what it is, really, right? But it's that presentation of, you know, and it's kind of what I was saying before, right? Like, if you are willing to suck it up, suck it up, suck it up and pretend to be something that you're not, which, you know, being complicit in bad decision making from your hierarchy is, you're putting yourself out to be something that you're not, then that's a problem. And I think it's like to envision it in a really simplistic binary way it's like on the one side of the seesaw, you have uh, change. And on the other side of the seesaw, you have your career. And whichever one you put the greater emphasis on, you will lose some of the other. So politicians who are like, I need to be here, which ends up actually being quite profoundly selfish as a way of thinking and egotistical and narcissistic, that you need to be there for the change. You end up sacrificing that change. Hmm. Whereas if you build a community as opposed to building a career, then you build the foundations to transform the um, kind of system and institution. But I just think that we've all been so deeply individualized for so long that we don't recognize uh, that 
it doesn't need to be us necessarily that does the thing like you know and that's why I feel really um lucky to recognize that like I would blow up my career tomorrow if I felt like it was the catalyst for something that I believed in uh transform or change mm. but so many politicians don't sit in that boat hey eh? they mm. think that they need to be there to do it I mean well like you know it's the uh, some some people you know, it's their livelihood, you know, that's their job, you know. and they've- Oh, totally. But also it's this, it's like. Stress. Why, yeah, why Why as well though would you get into politics if it is purely like a livelihood driven thing? It's supposed True. to be service. And I think that's another part of the problem is that it's it's definitely not seen as, as a service thing. It's seen as a, a power and a platform thing. And I find it real whack nowadays when people hit me up and they're like, um, how do I become an MP? And I'm like, why do you want to become an MP? Like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, you can totally become an MP if the reason is your kaupapa and that's your method. Mm. But I think you're getting the means and the ends confused, my friends. Like, becoming an MP should not be for the sake of becoming an MP. It's because you want to progress a kaupapa. I mean, being being in the Greens, like that, that automatically, you know that that uh that brass ring of being the prime minister and, and being you know like either uh, red or blue, you know, being in the Greens is pretty honest. Though you like just like you know what I don't give a fuck about that shit right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm here <laughs> I to do that stuff. That's not my vibe. I'm giving that up because yeah, it's like. I don't know, the equivalent of like swearing in to be, I don't know, some traditional like form of warrior where you give up your access to the crown or whatever, because you are going to be a foot soldier. You're going to fight the fight tooth and nail. Uh, And that's probably actually why reflecting on, you know, my colleagues that have come and gone, uh, why we have such a a short shelf life. Because as Greens, um, we literally give everything we got to it. And you know that becomes unsustainable at a certain point. Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting from the outside looking in, and um, being like a regular schmegular guy, you know, you just kind of like, fuck, what's going on here? And then um, you see stuff going on, and you're like, fuck me, like you know, and that's why I've, that's why I fucks with you, man. I was like, yo, <laughs> this one right here, man, she's she's got that she got that gumption. She's ready to roll. She's I'm giving like, it a go. I'm giving it a go. That's oh, for sure. Fuck. And then, um, you know, like, is there any other times that you've been like, you know, you've had to kind of question other people around you, like the other people around, not not in the greens, but just people that you know, and you're like, fuck, I never thought you were like that. Like, fuck, you know? Uh, I mean, there's definitely been um, interesting yarns. I, I think one of the uh, things which has blown my mind the most is, Just the assumptions that people hold about, because I've never been part of a political party prior to 2017 when I joined the party and then ran. Before that, I was an independent in the 2016 election. And before that, you know, I worked in gigs and event management and I was a freelancer and did like art pop-ups and um, was also a BFM. And I always thought that politics helped to inform our environment, but I didn't necessarily see value in being partisan. But you know, in order to be involved in a kind of platform uh, inside parliament, it always makes the most sense to align with where your cope up is at, but also your theory of change. Uh, and I guess the the stuff that's been real interesting is my Fano. Like uh, I have always used um, my Nana as kind of a litmus test of, uh, you know, a New Zealander who uh, has really worked hard, but also definitely um, has not really recognized that other people work really hard and don't necessarily reap the fruits of their labor. Yeah. So I was having this yarn with her um, uh, about two weeks ago um, during her birthday, actually. And uh, she was talking about how, you know, people just need to work real hard and then they'll be able to put down a deposit on a house. Why is everyone complaining about the fact that, you know, old people own all the homes? I was like, so Nana, um, how did you buy your house? And she was like, well, I sold my car and I put down a deposit. And I was like, okay, um, Mm -hmm. I understand that you worked really hard and that you sold your car and you put down your deposit. But to sell a car and put down a 
would be like a one tenth of a tenth of a tenth of a freaking deposit nowadays. And that doesn't discount your experience or whatever else, but it does mean to say that people can put in their equal amount of kind of work now and not achieve those same outcomes. And that's the ideas that we're talking about when we're talking about stuff like equality, right? Yeah. So more than anything, um, I think my major approach to stuff has been um, trying to recognize that most people don't come to their political views with an immense amount of malice. Uh, they kind of had been um, somewhat blinkered uh, in the way that they see the world. And they also have been inclined to identify with certain political parties based on the kind of rhetoric that they end up putting out there. Yeah. And it's real funny because actually speaking about like values and policies and whatever else in Australia, again, we don't have the money to do these kinds of polls, but in Oz, I, there was all of the political parties' platforms put in front of um, Australians that were polled. And the Australian Greens, which have relatively similar um, kind of policy positions, the majority of Australians chose to go with them. Um, when It's like the Pepsi or Coke test when you take the labels off, right? Yeah. But people don't engage in politics in that way because of all of the preconceptions and assumptions about what certain colours and certain names and certain political parties mean yeah. without engaging yeah. in their substance. Because I think, um, well, that's the other thing with um, politics as well, is some people are just, it's kind of like like they, their whole family is like, yo, we're nationals, you know what I mean? And then you kind of get brought up like that. Because your dad was was a nationals dude, right? Yeah, I mean, so my old man, I, th I don't like, man, it's taken me my whole life to try and figure him out. Uh, he always used to wind me up. Like the first prime minister that I really vividly remember um, was Helen Clark. And I remember paying a lot of attention during her kind of nine years. And I was really gutted uh, in the first election that I was really, really interested in voting in that I couldn't vote because I was 16, 17. Uh, and my dad used to always wind me up about John Key or about whoever the leader of the opposition was, um, the National Party leader. And I later, um, as I got older, uh, kind of hit dad up um, later in life when I think I joined the Greens, so probably about three years ago. And he told me uh, that he actually had only ever voted twice. And I think he's one of those people, right, who had identified with a lot of the rhetoric because he worked in finance even though he'd come from a mega working class background. Uh, and he was just like, well, yeah, individual responsibility, individual whatever. And then, you know, during the likes of the global financial crisis, he had this empathy gland open because he went through this experience where he understood what it was like to be poor. Yeah. And it's just really wild that it takes instances like that to happen to change people's minds. But back to that point, like, yeah, my old man um, was just one of those people who, interestingly enough, um, kind of identified but never really saw politics as playing a part in his life. Because, mm. um, yeah, and what about Nan? What, what did Nan, do you know what Nan voted for? Is this, is this the, before I go, is this the same Nan that was in Papua New Guinea? Uh, that was my grandma. Yeah, so different. Yeah, but my so my nana's my mum's mum, and uh, my grandma who was in Papua New Guinea. Um, she she's amazing. Uh, she worked at the refugee camp out in Mangere for thirteen years and took me there um, a bit after school and stuff. And that was also really um, developmental for me. But um, yeah, my nana is definitely still. So like, this is the funniest thing, and I'm trying not to shame my nana out here. Um, but my dad um, follows me so closely on social media now, and he's always like, "I remember this moment that I had. Um, I was like on uh, Mike Hosking's radio show, and I shared something about it on my social media. And my dad called me, and he's like, "Oh, everyone's like." thinks you did real well and then I was like dad where are you and he's like on your Facebook page and I'm like dad on my Facebook page of course everyone thinks I've done well like go on Mike Hosking's Facebook page <laughs> and you'll get a taste of the medicine but um <laughs> dad was like oh I've gone on um Judith Collins Facebook page and like some people are like grumpy reacting and whatever I went on Judith Collins Facebook page my nana had liked all of Judith Collins <laughs> <laughs> yeah Shut that's my final nana. bro <laughs> nana's out here on the other side man I know, I know. It's um, But it's kind of one of those things where, like, in having those yarns, right, she doesn't necessarily see herself as a super political person. And this is the problem, is that people get so deep in it, drink so much of the Kool-Aid, but don't necessarily reflect on how their decisions impact way more people, not just their social standing. Yeah. 
What are you drinking tonight anyway? What you got? Oh, mate, I've got a terrible uh, Hagen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, far from the usual uh, kind of craft beer. I am, of course, a wanker uh, who is a millennial and uh, likes tasty beer. But this is uh, leftover beer from my apartment warming that's been sitting in my fridge for a few months now. Uh, and given that we're in lockdown, we're in reduce, reuse, recycle mode. <laughs> it's getting ready, I think. i got some Cody's, man. You had a Cody? Oh, I've heard of Cody's. Yeah, I've heard of 8%. Cody's, yeah. Eight percent. <laughs> I can't say that I've been there. Um, at, maybe last time I was when I was a teenager. Oh, um, no. so yeah, on you. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I can't. I see. I can't drink. I can't drink it with the can on stream because everybody straight puts me in the old South Auckland stereotype of drinking Cody's. There's nothing wrong with Cody. Mate. I mean, no. Uh, not inherently. It's got a lot more to do with the stereotypes it's, and associations. So look free. at you, breaking down the stereotypes, mm. much like in your suit. Got my windsuit on, court case in a can. <laughs> there we go. Court there case in a can. Thank you there, Ulse. Uh Yeah, yeah. So, like, what I mean, like, what do you do to, like, just chill, man? Like, you know, you've got a very, very fucking 100 kilometer per hour fucking State Highway 1 job going on. And what do you do to just fucking chill out, man? Uh, um, it's, I, so before lockdown, I, like, you look at my calendar and I was booked out every single night. So that's kind of means that I have at least 8 a.m. to uh, usually 9, 10 p.m. at night uh, and including the weekends uh, every single day until September 9th, uh, which was about 10 days out before the election what the election was uh, but now being in alert level three lockdown uh, everything's been moved <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. i've been able to do um a lot more zoom hui, but also uh having stuff moved out has meant that i've had like more time to rest so for me it's kind of the holy trifecta that ends up being entirely overlooked and just cooked uh, i it's like diet, sleep, and exercise. Eh? Um, they all fall off uh, when I'm hard in campaign mode. One of the big things for my uh, well-being is actually I spoke to Tim, um, who's my right-hand man in Parliament, and uh, when I was having a real hectic, like dark time in uh, Parliament, but also in life uh, about a year and a half ago, I was like, I need to swear off an hour a day, doesn't matter if it's 7 a.m. in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, but I need an hour a day to go to the gym or to like go for a run uh, because for me, that's survival. <laughs> mm. uh, but then I totally cooked my foot when I was moving into this place uh, and I was in a moon boot for like six weeks. So I've been you real bad. I fell down one freaking stair. So it's not even a good story. <laughs> I tore I tore a ligament. Um, I was just like trotting down them. I blamed my dad's stairs. I was actually at his place and it was the morning that I was moving house. Uh, and I like landed on this real whack angle. And I've also been really bad at doing my physio exercises. So I haven't been particularly good at getting back up to the um, uh, capacity to run, but I've been back on the weights, but now the gyms are all damn closed. So yeah, yeah I've been... <sighs> watching a tiny bit of like Netflix and stuff. And um, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but uh, RNZ, uh, Alice Sneddon has been doing this amazing series called Bad News. Um, so I've been watching that. But yeah, other than that is basically just trying to take a second to breathe. <laughs> yeah, because like, I mean, yeah, like I said, it just must be like, especially now, like everything is just going crazy. So, and because you got that yeah. documentary thing that, that people with, um following you around in and things like that. that would have been crazy too yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty out the gate right because i mean all of us live our lives but i don't think um there's all too much uh and it's, it's one of those decisions that you make right when you go into the public eye is recognizing that your friends and your family didn't decide to do that Mm. And it's the same kind of thing as well for me, um, you know, with my boyfriend, Alex, who I was with before I came into Parliament and my partner now, like, it's been this process of going, all right, so what's on the table? What's off the table? What are they comfortable with? Uh, and then trying to navigate around that and like figuring out what spaces and places you're comfortable having people in. Like that documentary was such a fascinating process to go like, 
wow, um, I'm being interviewed and I'm going to say everything that I'm thinking. And then to have the headline run in the Herald's, Chloe Swarbrick says politics is F, asterisk, 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 asterisk. Yeah. And I'm like, really? There's a lot more context around that. But I sure, like, go for the controversial soundbite, you know? That's, um, that's the Herald for you, though. Yeah, but it was like, it, it was the Herald and then it was Stuff and then it was News Hub and then it was TV One and it was just everyone. And it's just realizing that you don't have control over, you know, you have influence and in mm. how you're perceived, but you don't have control over it. And that's the funniest realization around the likes of media because media, media is a mediation of reality. Um, you know, we know so much of what we know about the world based on um, what we see on TV or uh, read in the newspaper yeah. or read in books or whatever, but we don't have firsthand experience of that. So being really cognizant of the fact that this has gone through somebody else's filter before it's reached you is one of the core components of critical thinking. Yeah. And, but no, like, the, the the average mindset they don't they don't think like that they just think oh, oh that must be true don't even get me started on the conspiracy theory stuff oh but, man no yeah, we're not gonna yeah. go there cause... oh but I've got emails and emails and oh, emails really? about it oh yeah it does not sleep my friend like the um so in Parliament as well this past three years like we've dealt with some heavy stuff we've dealt with drug law reform we've dealt with abortion we've dealt with end of life choice we've dealt with prison reform like prisoner voting and just the people who kick off um kind of being like this is the one way that the world must be seen and being entirely unshiftable in recognizing different perspectives or evidence or data about different approaches but instead being driven by rhetoric um yeah it's gnarly but i mean it's very similar to how you know, some of the bullshit that comes out in, or oh, no, not that, but like, you know, how like stories come out. I am even the insinuations from the national and shit. Like, that was like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, that was next level. Oh. Um, yeah, that was, that was wild and very weird. Cause it's like, I mean, I think the thing that's not appreciated enough about parliament, right. Is that you have basically as a politician, two visions of power. One of them is in like the structure of parliament and the ability to change laws and negotiate and, you know, whatever. The other side is culture and culture by definition is about a shared set of values. And that's basically all about awareness and conversation and communities. And if you are spreading these really infectious but quite dark ideas, um, then you are using that power in some real dastardly ways. Yeah. But I mean, there's plenty of people that shit, no? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not even going to begin to get started on those other conspiracies, but some yes. fucking crazy ones, man. There's, there's some real dark stuff, and I just worry because it's like, I understand why people are vulnerable to this stuff. People are vulnerable to this stuff because they've never seen the system work for them. They yeah. have been um, trodden on and abused and ignored by MSD and the education system and ACC and the government, and the, they feel misrepresented in the media all that stuff, but it's just like they then become really ripe for the picking for these kind of strong men leaders who uh, kind of try and sell them all these solutions, which are broadly lies, but feel good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're fucking right, eh? Um, I, I, I totally uh, kind of get that vibe going on. And it's like every time, like that, that insinuation thing started it, man. Like, everyone was like, ha, 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 yeah, all good. And then he fucking said that, and everyone was like, well, uh, if he's saying it, fuck. Must be something. <laughs> it's mainstream go. now. Yeah, oh, fuck. And now we better, we better fucking, let's, everybody, let's get to Reddit and let's find some shit. And then, yeah, Reddit uh, is another fucking. Oh, system. Reddit is a, Reddit is an interesting place. Um, New Zealand Reddit, I've found, um, can, like, definitely be host of, some substantial decent discussions but then you get these real left of field people like i've never been a big time redditor but my mate tim bat um who's a comedian is and it's so interesting hearing his read and vibe on the whole setup um yeah because i've been real fascinated by uh like the kind of proliferation of different interpretations of the world and you know I talked to um Caleb Kane when he was over here he was the guy who the New York Times did this big uh exposure piece on did this podcast called Rabbit Hole which followed his YouTube history and how he got radicalized and fell into like the ideas of white supremacy and all these other things and I'm in touch with him relatively frequently now because I find it such a fascinating insight into how culture can shift and 
you know, my little brother's a 13 year old white kid who spends a lot of his time on YouTube. And I'm like, is my little brother susceptible to this stuff? Maybe you don't know, because, you know, if people are surrounded by feeling as though they're validated only through um, these voices that they're hearing on the internet, then that makes you massively vulnerable to somebody, you know, deciding to use that power in some suspicious ways. I had a cousin, my cousin Reese, and uh, right, this dude was like hearty into the UF UFOs, eh? And like, <laughs> fuck, man. I thought you were about to say the UFC, and I was like, I love the UFC, but that's where it starts. <laughs> no, 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 he was into the UFOs hard. Okay. Yeah. He would leave his camera up all night just at the stars and he would spend the whole day just fucking going through his, his footage to see if there's anything. Anyway, <laughs> then that turned into fuck he was all about the, the religions and all this, this and this and this and this. And then he was into freestyle raps. So you put all <laughs> of those together, you, that's his, his his thing. He would just straight up spit freestyles around Muhammad and uh, the difference between the UFOs and the pyramids and bruh, it was off the hook. And then I was the guy, my mum was like, you need to talk to him. I'm like, why me? And he, <laughs> he listens to you. So I had to have a conversation with him and holy shit. It was a one side. It was me talking for like two minutes. And then it was him just Tim. I don't know if you know this about the fucking Aztecs, mate, but then and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? It was the best though. And he had a lot of subscribers too. <laughs> You're literally living with yeah your cousin Reese from Ancient Aliens like <laughs> I know man. he was he was next level man on that shit and then like uh man he had so his uh, <laughs> his his YouTube channel and it got it got taken down because my auntie like hit him up like better uh, fucking take that shit down boy you gonna get a hiding it was like don't believe in sheeple. <laughs> The yeah, the classic wake up, eh? Yeah, like, the woke I mean, but that's the thing. Like, um, Tom Scott, you know Tom Scott, I love Tom Scott. Bowling Club. Yeah, yeah. So he um did this mean, and I've had some love words the two Is it about that? the idea of yeah, oh, um, oh. the um cannabis referendum and stuff. But he um did this really great um IGTV video on Instagram yeah. talking about how you know all these people have been hitting him up about conspiracies, and he's just like. Bro, why are you out here believing in like QAnon when you could literally look into the reality of the fact that Maori are fifty one percent of the prison population yeah. and fifteen percent of the regular population? That you could look at the discrepancies in the way that schooling is funding and funded in South Auckland versus uh, Central Auckland. You could look into so many things because that's a real conspiracy, my friends. Because that was the that was the that was the the whole thing, and it kind of leads into our next point. Was like that he he said you should look into the conspiracy of why education like is is uh money equals education or something it was along those lines too right so yeah. i mean you're a big advocate for education and you and i i totally am with you on that one so like my question is do you think that new zealand like the education system in new zealand is preparing kids for the future right now not not particularly well mm. um i do think that uh internationally we rank pretty decently but I also think that there is, so there's so many different things when you talk about education, right? Like this is one of the biggest and most mind blowing realizations in any area of policy is that you can't actually envision it in a vacuum. Because yeah. when you talk about education, it's also really important that we talk about housing because so many families that are in poverty, you also need to talk about poverty and income yeah. and work. Um, that so many families that are in poverty live in transients, meaning they bounce from house to house to house. They need to draw their kids in and out of school. And that means that a kid barely finishes a term there and then their education is entirely reset. So those are circumstances which exist theoretically entirely outside of the education system, but they massively impact educational outcomes. So that's a massive issue. Uh, and that is why I'm a big, big advocate for, you know, warm, dry, secure housing for all New Zealand is but you know that has to only and is only ever really going to be meaningfully achieved through economic reform but to the education system as a whole i i think that right now we focus far too much on regurgitation as a means of supposedly proving uh, or showing signs of intelligence um ncea has gone some way uh to improving that system 
but you know being involved in the um ncaa review there's definitely quite a few things that need yeah. to be improved uh one of which i think is better recognition of an application of critical and creative thinking skills because I think for way too long, our, our school system has been focused on producing workers, yeah. um, people who are able to do things like stick to routine, which, yeah, cool, all well and good, who are able to regurgitate whatever information. But the problem with that is people learn to conform effectively. Yeah. But what we need when we operate in a deeply uh, unpredictable time and space, and this is pre-COVID, this is like the world that everyone's talking about with disruption and whatever else and innovation, you need people who are able to think creatively and critically to rebuild society. If stuff starts falling apart a little bit, as it is right now around COVID, everything that we took for granted can't be taken for granted anymore. I think everybody, I, I think also... Um like, because there's a di digital curriculum coming in, mm, and everybody's mm. like putting all the eggs in that basket. Like, oh fuck, we're gonna we're gonna create some amazing fucking digital, but we don't have digital tech savvy teachers. And and see, that's the point. Is like, it's all great to go curriculum, boom. But mm. when you don't have the when you don't have the resources. You're not going to win nothing, you know? Uh, you need it all to align. Eh? Mm. And I mean, it's also that kind of thing, right, where I think different kids learn differently. Like speaking to my school experience, um, it could have probably been delivered to me on any um, means, yeah. but it also was the content. So it's like the content, the delivery, uh, how you were tested as well, because we know that um, particularly, you know, under national standards, which, you know, we got rid of, under national standards, kids were being tested far more than in the rest of the OECD countries that we regularly compare ourselves to. And that was making, um, reducing space rather, for a whole lot of other stuff that happens in the curriculum. I believe from a um, NZDI uh, kind of survey of teachers, like 83% of teachers said that it reduced the amount of stuff that they taught in their curriculum. So it's all of those different parts of the puzzle. Eh? Yeah. And yeah. I also don't think that any of these solutions, if I can be totally honest, they're going to meaningfully come from politicians who are so far removed from being at the front lines of the education system. And I also got really um, wound up uh, by the fact that there was this, this attempt to wedge parents and teachers as mm. though they're on different sides. Um, and this happens a lot in the political debate around education. It happens in early childhood. It happens in the compulsory sector. And it's basically going... Parents want this one thing and teachers want this other thing. And it's actually like, as far as I'm concerned, they should all want the same thing, which is um, actually what's best for the, the kid and for future generations. So I just hate the fact that it ends up being such a political football too. Well, do you think, um, you know, like you said, I don't think, I don't think yeah, people sitting in parliament aren't really, there's a lot of things like that. Like they probably think, this is the best thing for these motherfuckers. Let's throw this at them. <laughs> Oh, but they're all sitting like, in an yeah. ivory tower. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and this is why I'm a I'm a big advocate for um, devolving power. So um, for me, I think that local government is um, one of the best means to try and do that. The big problem with how um, kind of particularly the past 20 plus years has operated inside our um, parliament in Wellington is that there's been increasing blame on local councils for not doing stuff for their local communities, but they've had reducing resource. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like this real out of whack, out of balance setup. And I think that if we're to genuinely um, localize our systems and to create opportunity for communities to be uh, autonomous and self-driven and to live by their values, uh, that'll improve massive, uh, massively, like well-being, um, but also education outcomes. Because all that kind of stuff that you were talking about before around whakapapa um, and sense of place and purpose, that comes with people having control over um, what's happening in their local community and space and building on local expertise. So do you think uh, in a perfect world, if, uh, you know, in terms of uh, education and anything really, having those localized bodies of like, you know, this is the South Auckland uh, body or no, or, or is that what you're trying yeah, to get to? 
so there's um there's kind of some work underway in that and i don't now hold the broader education um portfolio i now hold just tertiary education because i came out muster became our muster after gareth um decided that he would be stepping down so i was involved when we were looking at rolling out what came after tomorrow's schools yeah. which is you know not to get too uber technical but basically looking at creating these systems of clusters or these like spoke systems mm. whereby there was the opportunity to particularly upskill boards of trustees because that's the other thing like the board of trustees model inside of our schools has so much potential in terms of like driving the curriculum uh ensuring that there's like a solid co-papa and culture in the school but it typically just ends up being parents who have quite intense opinions which isn't always a bad thing but you know they then have to make decisions about like kids getting excluded or suspended yeah. and all of these other things which they're not necessarily um professionally developed or equipped for so i'm really happy about um the fact that we have raised the bar on that and required that there is those new um kind of professional development courses too because that's a matter of governance yeah. but in order to achieve that level of higher um kind of threshold or quality governance you also need to make sure people are resourced because i find very often that we blame people for not um reaching bars that we set in these like kind of vacuums without realizing they just don't have the money or the time or the space to come up to those levels because I think um, it really comes down, yeah, it really comes down to, I mean, the board of uh, the governance of the school, right? So like, uh, yeah, like you said, sometimes, man, you just get some real hardcore bias, like parent on there that kind of rules the roost because they've have got, got a real strong personality. And then that doesn't really, that's not the best choices, you know? Oh, and I mean, the other thing, which is real funny, um, or actually quite sad, to be honest, but it's uh, sex ed. Like sex education is effectively determined by school boards, whether they end up teaching something which is far more realistic mm. or whether they end up teaching something which is closer to the kind of abstinence end of the spectrum, whether they teach healthy relationships or something else entirely. So that historically has been a real problem for some kids coming out of school, having next to no understanding of, the, of how relationships work and how consent works and whatever else. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, some kids know heaps. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was that kid. <laughs> Yeah, but then there's the kids who go to the abstinence-based kind of education, and then they end up getting all the education from porn, and it's like that's a big problem as well, you that know. Was, yes, no, no. <laughs> not that I know Chloe, but I not that friend, you know. My yeah. friend was like that. One of my mates, he was like that. Man, I was like, you're dirty, bro. Oh, but it's like it gets to this point, hey, where we just have to realize, and it's the same kind of thing around the discussion with um, drug law reform. If you teach kids that they do this thing and then they'll die or the sky will fall in or whatever, they're not going to trust or respect you. Our children are smart. You actually have to teach them the real risks of doing something and then they will make an educated decision. I think we forget what it was like when we were teenagers and didn't believe anything our parents said. But if they're straight up and honest with you, then you're way more likely to trust them. Yeah. And if you've got a track record and a rapport of telling them the truth and being real with them... I think sex ed is an interesting one, man, because like, mm. when do you start? You know, like, what do you, when's the time? Like, you know, you never know that stuff. But another one, uh, like, yeah, when do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, um, so on the sex ed stuff, like, the. Important, uh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah no. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the education um, kind of experience, um, or rather, research has shown that it kind of makes sense to start uh, seeding education for kids and health classes and PE uh, when they are younger, mostly just about their body and the yeah. fact that they are allowed to say no to people, whatever, yeah. uh, which is also really useful for um, recognizing particularly, you know, um, just to be real for a second, like I, abuse does end up coming typically in places and spaces where people know their abuser. So that is yep. useful for our young people to know, not just in the schooling environment, mm. but also at home. So um, talking about those things and perhaps getting, you know, graduating through uh, and talking more about ideas of relationships as they get into like intermediate. Mm. Uh, and then in high school, um, you can do the proper birds and the bees um, in a legit fashion uh, and try not to make everyone laugh. <laughs> I, I remember the, poli the police run something where they come in and they talk to parents and stuff like that. It was really, I can't remember what it's called. 
But um, as a teacher, you know, you'd do, they'd give you a couple of things and then the, the police officers would come in and, and run. And it was really around abuse and, um, you know, when to say no, how to say no and well, mm. who can you talk to, those types of things. And that was all the way down to year, I think it was year five, year six. Yeah. I was like, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. What's something yeah. in the curriculum that you would add that's not in there at the moment that you think? Te reo Māori. Uh, that, would be, that would be the key one for me. So for me, that's, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about mental health um, because of my experience, but also because it's something that I'm deeply passionate about. And I feel like it's kind of been cracked, cracked open as a subject for us to talk about as a country. But we often talk about it as though it exists, again, in a vacuum. We don't talk about the precipitating factors to the manifestation of mental ill health. We talk about um, the fact that uh, people are suicidal or self-harming or abusing substances, but we're not like, but why are they doing that? And what we know um, about mental ill health predicated on the Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry, Hiaro Oranga, uh, released last year, is that basically you can have a biological predisposition, so you can inherit kind of certain genes from your parents, uh, to have a propensity towards mental ill health or addiction. But your environment, your circumstances, your experiences can either trigger, um, exacerbate, or minimize um, those. So for me, kind of recognizing uh, where we're at, our place in the world, and having a sense of belonging is one of the best ways to turn down that potential propensity towards experience of isolation, trauma, whatever else, and to figure out the language to work through it. And I think that learning te reo Māori, you cannot do without also learning about te ao Māori and mm-hmm. about tikanga. And I just think that that would be a massively unifying thing um, for our country. I, I really wish like um, more more t- uh, more Maori kind of got behind you guys because because the Greens are the only ones that like like the, the respect the treaty and they, yeah. they you know, it's the treaty <laughs> yeah there is that yeah like you know a lot of that's that that's one thing that it's really funny man like the treaty is quite like a tokenistic thing in the curriculum mm-hmm. like it's like yo you have to teach this but they never fucking teach you how like. Yeah. You have to do it yourself, and you never get taught at uni what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you get the, oh, this is a pepeha. You know, you have to teach them how to do a pepeha, and th- that's it pretty much, you know? But, like, there's yeah. nothing like, yo, this is what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And I think... and that, Yeah, I mean, so we've been working through, and one of the things that I was proudest of in the, um, in the last few months of me being education spokesperson before I just moved to tertiary is... Uh, we created the uh, requirements around New Zealand history in schools. So there is going to be a way stauncher uh, curriculum established in that, uh, which I think will go some way to remedying um, those problems in an intergenerational way uh, and hopefully providing people with a sense of unity, understanding of place and purpose, because there right now is too many myths about uh, colonization and about the treaty and not enough um, straight up understanding um, from historians, like people people aren't connecting with the genuine historians or um, the experts in this field are actually looking at the like just written research, but you know, in a place that was colonized 160 odd years ago, we um, are not doing a particularly good job right now of recognizing that a lot of the history which has been mainstream has been written from one perspective. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't it hasn't typically been from the Maori perspective. I mean, even things like uh, even things like the wars, like even things yeah. like Parihaka, like you know, um, even as uh, Ihumato, even stuff like that, yeah. like. Like people have got to really understand that this is what it's about, man. Like, yeah. And that's man, me as an educator, I yo, I'm going hams at that all the time. <laughs> like I'm like I don't even care. It's not even in the curriculum. I'm like I don't even care. We're going all the teachers hard. are radicals, my friend. This is why teachers are so good. <laughs> oh, some of them, blah blah blah. <laughs> but, you, you nah, know, but I mean, you also, um, you know, you, you have to realize, um, and I think most people um, who engage in kind of trying to talk about the education system probably do, Mm. that uh, when you are teaching things about the world, you have to apply critical thought to them. And that is is the reason that teachers exist, 
Because if you provide somebody just with a blank piece of, well, a piece of material uh, that they then have to read and they aren't educated about how to pick that apart to understand that somebody wrote that and the person who wrote that had a life experience and that life experience came from something that happened to them or whatever else, then you just read things without that nuance and that's how you end up with conspiracy theorists. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah true. That's a good point. Do you think, um, is, is he going to be... Do you think in the future there'll be any inclusion of some Pacifica um, history in terms of like, say, like the Maul movement, um, the independence of, of, of Samoa, uh, things, yeah, you know, uh, is, do you think that's happening? Is that happening? I think it's totally plausible. I think it's a matter of uh, at what point we uh, talk about that inclusion, right? Because one of the big challenges that we've got, and I've experienced this in trying to have these public, uh, very loaded, very political debates about what goes in, what goes out of the curriculum, mm. is so many people kind of go, oh, you know, we just need to teach our kids maths and English, and that's all they need to know, maths and English, because then they'll be able to survive in this doggy dog late capitalist society. Yeah. And it's like, well, what if we gave our kids the tools to figure out how to recreate or inform the world mm. that they live in? And that is, I think, the kind of nub of where we get to what do we include and what do we disclude? What do we emphasize? What do we decide to not emphasize as much? Where does it become discretionary and where is it compulsory or universal? And I don't know. I don't know the best solution or answer to those things, uh, but I think it ultimately is a reflection of the things that we as a society value. And at a certain point, there is a, a moral judgment, a value judgment about the things that we value. Uh, and the fact that, you know, stuff was so charged, like the taxpayers union, I think, put out this real heated press release at the point that we decided that we would be putting New Zealand history in schools, mm -hmm. being like, kids are going to have no time to learn maths. It's like, oh, come off it. But also, um, this is the kind of stuff that you end up against. And that probably showcases the rub and the challenge in trying to change anything politically is that you have to figure out how you justify it to people who are vehemently opposed to you and who will deeply misrepresent your view. Because, I mean, like, yeah, because we you talked earlier about skeletons in your closet. Mm. Like, them are the skeletons right there. You know what I'm saying? If you have to, if you're like, yo, this is what actually happened at, at the at the treaty. This is what happened at Parihaka mm. when they slayed many young children and, and, and raped and pillaged, uh, a, 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 you know, a very, very uh, a peaceful village. Yep. And you talk about the mole movement and how, um, you know, bring a disease and, and, and then all of that stuff. Man, them, them's are some skeletons, bro. Like, and you know, and I think that's probably why we need people like you that are kind of like pushing it. Like, hey, these, yeah. we gotta, we can't be kind of hiding these in the closet for the rest of mm -hmm. eternity. Those are the real conspiracies, like we were talking about before. Exactly, you know, right? the fact that the fact that these things are not necessarily understood in a mainstream way means that there is a kind of deriving of uh, some problematic views, <laughs> to say the least, and some upholding of uh, some deeply uh, hurtful approaches to the world, which mean that some people are protected and other people are not. Yeah. Do you think, and this is this, uh, you know, we're getting from like, you know, more uh, secondary school and tertiary education. Do you think that like legalizing marijuana will uh, will, will hinder uh, any growth in the education uh, sector? I should say, hinder in what way? Like uh, kids just getting getting you know like being being able to access a marijuana. Uh, yeah, you no. Know? Nah, so they already um, do, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 totally. So, um, what we have seen, you know, if you look to the overseas research, uh, is that actually indications, particularly from Canada, have shown that there are 24 months after the fact a decreases of about 8% in usage um, amongst young people. Uh, but also we often tend to refer to Canada, which is only about two years down the track, to 13 odd different states in uh, the US, which have legalized a lot of them in deeply commercial ways, which is absolutely not the route that we're going down. And we tend to neglect Uruguay. <laughs> Uruguay um, was actually the first country in the world to legalize and they went down a route that was almost entirely about harm reduction. So they have the state uh, producing and controlling all of the um, 
grow ops. But the problem with Uruguay is that they didn't approach it in the same way that Canada did with the intention to develop an evidence base to continue tweaking their ledge. So unfortunately, Canada does have the best uh, kind of data. Unfortunately or fortunately, as the case may be, because we are looking to fall somewhere between Uruguay and Canada. So um, the data is demonstrated from Canada that, uh, if anything, it decreases youth usage. Uh, and if anything, uh, it also only serves to start to displace the black market, which is where younger people are inclined to get cannabis from. The argument can always be made that, uh, you know, if somebody's older brother or sister or somebody steals like they would steal a cigarette or, a, you know, beer from their parents or whatever, but the fact of the matter is that if that were to occur under a legalized regulated market, it would be a far safer product to begin with because it would have labeling on it, which would warn the potential consumer about the harm that's yep. associated to it. It would have limits on potency. Uh, and also, you know, they could access help if they needed it. And all of those things to me speak to a far safer kind of construct. And therefore also actually speaking about education, we know right now that under criminal prohibition, um, kids can get expelled uh, or suspended for cannabis. And that has a massive impediment on uh, kids' education. So that uh, alone, removing that ability to stand down or expel kids for um, the use of illicit substances and instead continue to educate them uh, and to provide them with those outcomes that are better for them in life, uh, all the better. Because, I mean, education would be a huge, like, you know, educating people on, uh, you know, what is, man, that's the most gangster shit you ever did just then, uh, Chloe. You just like, yo, blah, 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 and you just slicked it up like, boom. <laughs> there was some I'll let you know that shit. there wasn't that much left in there, but yeah, I did. <laughs> that was some Jake the Must shit right there, man. You just grabbed it, whack. <laughs> but no, um, like, because I think there's a bit of a, uh, there's a bit of a stigma around like substance use, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's kind of like illegal where... substance use, though. There's next yeah. to no stigma around legal substance use. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's also I really like love to investigate what people mean or what they think of when they think of a drug, because in the States, right, pharmaceutical stores are called drug stores. Yep. first and foremost but people when they think of drugs go ah oh, that's the bad stuff cannabis is absolutely a drug but so is alcohol so is tobacco so, so is, is sugar coca-cola so is like yeah, exactly. everything right yeah. anything anything that alters your physical or psychological state can be characterized as a drug. Mm. And we regulate most of them to certain extents to reduce potential harm. We don't do that enough with alcohol, but also we have the opportunity to do that with cannabis. And I find it just absolutely ridiculous that people are willing to say stuff like, oh, you know, um, why do we want to introduce another substance? Yeah. And I'm like, have you really thought about this? Because, you know, I'm sorry, but the cat is out of the bag. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's 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 so far gone. We're not inventing cannabis through this debate. What we're doing is deciding how we best regulate it. That was one of the most annoying things on that interview that you did um, with that that old fella. I can't even. I don't even know his name. I can't. There's been a few, my friend. But the... <laughs> no, 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 you know the one. The, the, this one. The, what the fuck? Oh, Nick one. Smith. Yes. Nick Smith. All right. Was that you? Were repeatedly telling him that. You're like, no, no, we're not inventing something new. It's been here already. Oh well, you know. And then he brought up his own kids, and you're like, well, what? And and y'all, this is the this is the the G'd up part. You said, do you think your kids aren't doing it? Oh fuck! I was like, yo, fucking got his ass. And then he was <laughs> like, eh, 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 and then you fucking got him on that one. But for real, it's the you know, if if adults sort of think about their own kids, you can hope and pray that your kids aren't going to engage in certain things, but. You know, 80% of New Zealanders will try cannabis by the time they're 21 years old. And that data actually comes from a cohort of people that are now in their 40s. So now that there is far more discretion with how police are prosecuting people, I would hesitate to guess that it's potentially even higher. Uh, and we still don't have 80% of the population uh, with cannabis convictions. So therefore, the rule of law is demonstrably broken. But then you also have the fact that all these people are getting it from the black market. I just, I don't see how people can justify retaining the status quo when it's failing so hard. What's the craziest justification of uh, not having, that you've heard from in the last year or so? 
Oh, there was this really out the gate. Uh, so there was this dude who turned up at a panel um, that I was on who uh, started filming me and was real aggressive. Uh, and he then hit me up and was like, what about vaping? What about vaping? You know, vaping, uh, I'm in advertising and vaping is catching on. And I'm like, well, there's a reason for that. Vaping has been in a regulatory gray area for a real long time. They're currently self-regulated and that's why they've been able to advertise. <coughs> Uh, we have the opportunity to better regulate that and we are going through a process to do that, which will remove sponsorship, remove advertising. So there won't be influencers advertising in front of YouTube videos. And actually what you're proposing is that we better regulate vaping. And it was just this, again, this moment of this person thinking that they had this really big yeah. gotcha based on using a substance or a product that needed to be better regulated. Yeah. And I'm like, actually, that is my logic, my friend. But again, because of the stigma associated to the idea of cannabis, which is not something that I expected to ever be getting into in politics, by the way, but because of the stigma associated to it, mm. it's just, it blows some people's minds. And they just think that I'm like this awful human being who's like going to, I don't know, throw children off a balcony or something um do you get do you get a lot of people like calling out on the streets like yo legalize mother <laughs> regulator <laughs> regulate yeah, yeah um there's there's not typically like i do get um so i live in central auckland um just off of karangahape road so like i get um a few folks recognizing me out and about which is really lovely but um yeah i do get people hitting me up about it's real funny because sometimes i'll put um, an interview that I've done just because I remember that I haven't put it on social media. I'll put it on social media after the fact and someone will hit me up and be like, oh, you did that real great interview. And I was like, which one? Like, <laughs> there's, a, there's, been a, there's been a few random interviews, but also thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's um, like the funniest thing, right, is I'll get all of this um, quite intense stuff online. Um, you know, some of it good, some of it quite intense and vitriolic, but no one's ever said anything um, cruel to me uh, in person. And I think awesome. that kind of speaks to, yeah, but that kind of speaks to the real problem with uh, the confidence that people develop to uh, say these things on the internet when they're not willing to back it up in real life. That's what I like about you too, man. You go, you you go hard in the paint when it comes to like getting clapping back at some some cats. Uh, <laughs> I'm just like, like AK, just brrr, brrr, brrr. like, what do you expect? Like, I, you know, I'm a millennial. I know how to work the internet, and if you're gonna like, I also just don't know how some people find my stuff. It's like, if you hate me so much, why are you following me? That's a that's an internet thing. <laughs> I, everyone thinks they they get the, get on the keyboard warriors until the gangster shit comes up and then you, you show up like, Hey motherfucker. No, you don't say that. But I'm like, Hey, very... welcome to my platform. No. Oh, do they actually come on your page and do that? Yes. Oh, yes. Man. My page and do that stuff. And I'm like, what are you expecting here, bro? Let's go, man. Put, get the gloves out, man. Just be like, yo, I'm into the car park. It's pack and save. Let's go. Oh, honestly, always polite. But I'm just like, do you know what you're saying here? Do you know how this world actually works? That's the thing. Hey, <laughs> eh? The other thing too that we kind of haven't touched on is the conviction rate, mm. especially in especially in Maori. You know, yeah. it's um, it is it is quite concerning. Around mm -hmm. um, my uncle, for one, is went inside before uh for for uh it wasn't just having having plants on, but you know he was he had a lot of other things going on. But the plants were the things that were like, oh, he's got plants on him. He yeah. had a lot of plants for me. I'm telling you, this yeah. motherfucker was a yo. He he was tatted up, had mockles on, everything, but shit, that dude knew how to, he knew about his herbals, you know? <laughs> but um, shout out to Uncle Alti, by the way. I, I don't know if you got that inside. I but hope you're outside, Uncle Alti. He's, he's not, he's still inside. Oh, Uncle Alti. I got hope you. that you're getting the reformation that you need. But it is, it is, and you know, the other thing is like, they go, oh, well, like, it hasn't been documented like it's gone down it hasn't gone down i don't think it's gone down it's like it's on top of other shit you know oh yeah yeah, yeah. there's definitely um so 
what the Prime Minister and Chief Science Advisor report showed is that if we legalise tomorrow, then you would have 1,300 less Māori convicted per year for cannabis offences. So 1,300 is not an insubstantial sum, but usually what you'll have is people who are proponents or advocates of continued prohibition will say, oh, but not many people in prison, only several people are in prison. And it's like, okay, but prison is not the be-all, end-all of a conviction. A conviction is still something on your permanent record that can prevent you from getting a job that can prevent you from traveling that can completely shut down and close off your future so I think just that alone is enough of a reason but you add on top of that the fact that I don't know any white kid ever who's got a conviction for cannabis it's policed very disproportionately and evidently like based on evidence in a racist way and it's uh it's it's crazy man I was talking to my mate here's another side thing he's uh he works for uh uh probation and he mm. said he said that i think it was like 75 percent of all people that have gone inside that are inside their first offense is a driving offense for having no license yeah so i think that's something major like in terms of uh, shout outs to my bro shannon i don't know if he's watching but yeah he's um like it's huge like that's your first kind of that's your gateway fucking mm-hmm. you know and you can't pay that's 400 bucks for having no things like you know and maybe and then it compounds and then it compounds if you can't pay that and then you end up with a lag and then whatever else like it compounds and it compounds and it compounds and it completely turns your life around Um, and i just i don't think that enough people um particularly those who think that prison is a place where bad people go without any nuance or understanding of how the criminal justice system works and the fact that the majority of people in prison right now uh, have gone through immense amounts of abuse themselves or uh, have, you know, really poor literacy rates, really bad outcomes in terms of mental health or fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, just connecting all of those dots draws it brings you to a very different picture to the one that we have right now of a very simplistic world where bad people go inside and that's that. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, and that, that brings on more stress and, you know, like adds on to people's mental health. Mm. That's what I'll kind of want to touch on next, right? Is that like, why is it, why is it so, why is mental health such a funny thing in the public eye in New Zealand? We do have a problem with it. It's obvious. Mm. I mean, mm. suicide rates are off the fucking hook, like mm. for us. But yet, oh yeah, per capita, um, you know, particularly fucking, our youth suicide yeah. rates is amongst the highest in the world. Yeah, We're and young that, Maori you know? men. Uh, yeah, the most um, represented in that. So um, I think it's a number of things, eh? But to be perfectly honest with you, it's probably indicative of um, inequality and a feeling as though you can't uh, reach out for help without necessarily being a burden. And it's that stuff that I was saying before, like in terms of people's environments triggering them, the major driving factors are isolation, trauma and poverty. And all of those things bounce off of each other because when you are impoverished, you're more likely to become traumatized and you're more likely to therefore uh, isolate yourself because you don't want to be anybody else's burden. So it just becomes this downward spiral where you continue to alienate and ostracize yourself thinking that you're going to deal with it. And then you're like, well, I'm this massive burden on everybody. And I genuinely think that the only way to meaningfully solve that is to recreate some notion of community where people are able to have the time and the space to support each other. Because we have all of these myths about like resilience. If only young people these days, you know, so Mm. the saying goes, had more resilience. And I'm like, what the hell do you mean by resilience? Because it's not like young people are like massively wrapped in cotton wool or whatever. It's also, as I was like speaking to with my Nana's example, you know, like, it is way harder to do the basics nowadays. And that's not to have a drag on, you know, any of the older people who fought their way and whatever else, but it is to say that times are different and that's okay. I'm not having a go at you by saying that, you know, Um, but to work through that process and then to realize that resilience is actually a community trait. You need someone to step up uh, when you are feeling bad and vice versa. Uh, to kind of recognize that actually it is peak unsustainable to uh, think that you can work 80, 90 plus hours a week if only you get a massage. That's the problem with the commodification of well-being mm. culture, you know? Just get a massage and then you can keep doing all of this deeply unsustainable mahi. So 
actually going to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that people are overworked, underpaid, overstressed, and some of them are unsustainable because, uh, so, sorry, some of them are unhopeful because they are un insecure in their housing and in their work. And then you end up being insecure in your relationships and it just plays and plays off of each other. So, you know, the best way to actually solve um, the mental health crises is to make sure that everybody has the income they need to survive. So it's a byproduct really of poverty. Right? It's a massive byproduct of poverty. Yeah, especially when you look at the demograph demographics of people who are overrepresented in our mental health stats. Uh, our young people who feel as though they have to take on the world themselves and their parents are working way too much to realize what's going on for them. Our um, particularly young Maori men who are born into intergenerational poverty and feel as though they are a burden and that they can't speak out about it because then they become more of a burden. It's a byproduct of poverty. And it was said best to me um, by Philly, who is an amazing um, student. She's a head girl, um, year 15, uh, at a school in South Auckland. And she said, you know, raising people's incomes is suicide prevention. Providing people with stable housing is suicide prevention. Like providing people basic health care uh, that is accessible and affordable to all is suicide prevention. And I was just like, holy hell, this is like hitting me hard. Oh, that's a great leader right there. Yeah. That's somebody that has some critical, a very critical mindset that can kind of, you know, see things before they happen. That's fucking awesome. Oh, Shout she's incredible. Family. Yeah, she's also leading, um, so she's started this crew called For the Culture, uh, which is bringing together all these Pacifica kids um, in South Auckland on uh, this mahi to lead and change the culture in School Strike for Climate. I'm not sure if you followed all the drama around um, Pacifica last year or the year before and how the School Strike kids, who are all these kind of well-doing uh, like goodwill white kids in central Auckland hadn't realized that they had planned the school strike on the day of Pacifica and she kind of called them out and completely changed the culture on it it's been mean to watch her grow I just had a look online that's the uh, Aurere College that's the, yes yeah. yes it is yeah that's so uh, yeah because I think well like I mean we kind of touched on a little bit and we came we'll come back to it in terms of like environmental factors mixed with hereditary effect with mm. um with with uh mental health um in layman's terms and, and to cut it down because i mean it could go really deep but mm. um for hereditary factors that in, in for Maori pacifica um is there quite a like how is, is it quite known in the in the communities that this is just this is mental health because i think mental health in Maori pacific island um communities are very like ah Ah, stop it! You know, ah, just you know, have a yeah, like you said, have a message. Some of them get into that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, there's definitely it's been interesting looking at different cultural kind of approaches to it, right? Because even the notion of mental health is quite a Western notion. Um, but then you look at um, models like the Haora, which is um, you know a tikanga Maori approach to recognition of wellness and well-being. Uh, funny and tapafa. Yeah, and that um, kind of holistic approach to your well-being um, exists entirely outside of and very differently to the Western model, which is like, here's your physical body, what we can diagnose you with, and here's the pills that we can give you to sort that out. Um, and I think that's been a big part of the problem, right, is that we've attempted to wedge in all of these cultures through the system that doesn't recognize or reflect different approaches or different cultural nuances or understandings. And in turn, you obviously end up with massively disproportionately different outcomes for different cultures, you know, Maori in particular, you know, the... Um, claim and the Waitangi Tribunal um, on those disproportionate um, outcomes for Māori through our health system and how that obviously fails to treat your Waitangi. But I think um, there is still this massive um, kind of grappling with uh, the fact that sometimes we inherit um, our circumstance as well. Uh, there is a real lack of understanding of that disconnection between nature and nurture uh, and some people just kind of say that you know it's about poverty of spirit if you have poverty of circumstances but it's also about recognizing that you know it becomes a whole lot harder to have affluence of spirit when you're in poverty of circumstances 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a completely different world. Yeah. When you're in it, you know, when you're in the eye of the storm and shit's going on all around you, you know, it's different Constantly. from... Oh, yeah, man, and you're sitting in the ivory towers and you're just like, oh, no, this is what you should do. It's very different. But I think... Yeah. I think uh, the Fali Tapafa and the uh, Fali Tapafa, which mm. is, um, you know, it is very, it is a very holistic approach to it, you know, and there is there is sides to it. And we're starting to do a little bit more in education, which is great. But I think that's learning those those skills of being able to cope, being mm. able to ask for help, you know, and it comes back to education. And I think, um, I think like from being in the, in the eye and, 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 you know, living in South Auckland all my life, you know, you definitely see it around. You know, I've had many, many of friends, um, you know, have uh, mental health illnesses and then c- committing suicide. And it's, um, you know, and then you think back like, man, you know, like, why didn't the bro just ask for some help? Yeah. They just didn't know, like, you know. I'm yeah, didn't him, know like, how, didn't yeah. have a model for it. Yeah, how to, um, yeah how I'm to, wondering I'm sorry, why he bro. didn't do something that he didn't, you know, he, you know, he didn't have uh, any, any tools to do. Mm. It's about teaching him about those tools, yeah? Mm. Hmm. All right. Um, we'll get on to some some questions because I've got so many here, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. Oh, here we go. Uh, this one's about um, legalization as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, the reform. Legalize and monitor distribution of all drugs or just cannabis. So the all answer drugs. to this, yeah, the the answer to this cannot be taken as a soundbite. And this is a really important preface because one of the many reasons that I've been hesitant to engage in this dialogue is because I'm really conscious that often uh, the debate around drugs, let alone cannabis, ends up becoming part and parcel of this fear, obfuscation and doubt campaign. And I'm also really aware that there's been um, a ton of right-wingers recently pouring through all of the interviews that I've ever done trying to drag stuff out of context. So on this, um, it's important to recognize that you basically have a spectrum of approaches to substances, right? On the one end of things, you have a complete prohibition, black market control. On the other end of things, you have a complete free market, uh, complete commercial control. Both ends of that spectrum, you have the maximization of harm because you have entities that are incentivized to exploit vulnerable communities to make a quick buck. So to pull away from both of those extremes means that you get to this space in the middle of regulation. Regulation means that you pull away uh, that kind of uh, support for or lack of regulation of the free market. Uh, So you remove the ability to do things like advertise or to sponsor and therefore glamorize their product, product placement, etc., And if you pull away that uh, support for the black market through pushing it into the light and regulating sale and supply, then you undercut their ability to sell and supply that product. So I fundamentally believe that regulation is the best approach carte blanche, but that that does not mean that the same approach needs to be applied to all substances. So a really good example of one of the potential approaches that we could take, for example, to methamphetamine, is expanding the likes of uh, the Te Aroa Oranga um, collaboration between DHB and police in Northland, which effectively actually for all intents and purposes decriminalizes the use, but actually attempts to uh, wrap people, uh, provide people with that support in their lives so that they can access education or health or housing if they need it, they can access a job and they will be subsidized, um, their employer will be subsidized for taking them on. And what you do when you provide people with that wraparound support for a better livelihood is that you recognize that actually being an addict sucks. Uh, Being an addict is a symptom of a pretty terrible life. It's just a symptom. And in punishing them, you're only dealing with the symptom. You're not dealing with the cause. Uh, The other kind of classic that I'm asked about is the likes of psilocybin mushrooms, LSD. Um, On that, it's probably worth noting that I helped to get through um, Ministry of Health, uh, the first three uh, experiments, research projects locally here in Aotearoa from the University of Auckland on the efficacy of psilocybin to treat uh, what's called treatment-resistant depression and PTSD in a controlled environment. Um, All of this research has been completely um, pushed off to the side as a result of prohibition. There hasn't been the ability to study these drugs or how effective they could be uh, at treating these kinds of things. 
So getting those through and getting the results soon is really important and is going to be really useful for building that evidence base. Um, the final thing that I would just say is that all of the research has shown out of the World Health Organization that a huge number, a huge number of the population of the world uses illegal drugs uh, for recreational purposes and 90% of them do not end up being addicted. Wow. So what that shows is that 10% of people have something underlying, which is typically those kinds of issues that we were talking about before situationally. It doesn't necessarily speak to a good experience for all of those people, but it does speak to the issue of addiction and returning to constant problematic use. I mean, that's a very um, well-known misconception that if you, oh, like gateway drug, oh, that's the uh, gateway drug. I mean, that's been completely <laughs> disbanded by um, all prominent researchers in the area of um, mental health and addiction. But it can t I mean, the, the best that you can do on the gateway hypothesis is to confuse uh, the ideas of uh, causation and correlation, because there definitely is a semblance of correlation, but only in jurisdictions where cannabis is illegal, which means that people have to get it from the hands of somebody who probably is likely to sell them something else. Yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, where cannabis has been effectively decriminalized, but actually arguably regulated, and I had this argument with a, an official from the Netherlands um, when I was in the UN in Vienna, uh, the, for 43 years, they have had a decriminalized market. And they are the only country in the world that do not have that correlation of uh, somebody using harder substances or inclined to use harder substances after using cannabis because you get it from a coffee shop. You're not exposed to the criminal underground. Yeah. All right, next question is from Uskot Game. He said, uh, name one person uh, you would scrap in a charity boxing <laughs> match. Any political party. Uh, from any political party. Oh boy, um, this is a good one, eh? I'd actually love to go one outs with um, David Seymour, to be honest. David Seymour? Um, let's yeah. Call, let's call him out right now. <laughs> I don't know if calling him out is a good idea, given that he's um, inclined to do the call outs on the social medias. But look, you know, bro, I have uh, nine years of martial arts experience. I have uh, seven years in karate and about two and a half years uh, in mixed martial arts, particularly uh, in Muay Thai. So yeah. please come at me. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be your hype man for that one. Hey, David Seymour, <laughs> I don't give a fuck anything. G, one ounce car parks, Muay Mu Thai. What you know? David and I have worked together on a few things. Yeah, so I just we, think we're about to work together in the hospital ones. for your teeth, motherfucker. We're bringing you down, son. Oh, this is all Tim. I need everyone to know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. All right, uh, here's one from Nutellica. He says, uh, what's your favorite ride at uh, Rainbow's End? <laughs> I don't know what it's called, but it's the one that, like, puts you in those um, little things that you go like that. It's, like, by the um, – the uh what's the ship called the pirate ship um pirate ship is my old man's favorite ride so i'm a Yo. big fan of the pirate ship but it's the like spinny one that you like sit in a seat on and then go all over the place like that okay man there's no more pirate know. ship man it's being taken out really yeah man oh that's because they did the whole fancy thing with rainbow's end they got like the big tall things that go out now man, you haven't been there for a while eh? i can tell I've been there for ages <laughs> No, no, no. AA. So you know the AA. They uh, they sponsor. They have a ride there. It's like this little these little kids, and they teach them how to drive and stuff. It's pretty cool. Oh, so yeah. No, I remember going on that when I was a kid. They've oh. been around forever. The spinning thing. No, no, the, no. The... This is a different one. These are like actual cars. Actual you know? cars. Well, no, not actual cars. Little tiny miniature cars. And the, you go into this room and they teach you around how to give way, how to use a roundabout, all these things. And it's for little kids. They go in it because they got rid of that big dome thing. Remember that big dome, that oh. 360 thing that nobody went to? Mate, are you working in PR for Rambo's End? I don't know. I should be. I should be. <laughs> i tell you what, though. Yo, the log flume, the best place to uh, Log flume. Log yo, flume is That's where you take, you take the old MIDI and get, get the old pashes. Uh, but also those photos yeah those photos okay. were i man one time i jumped out and i was like running through the forest and like they have cameras everywhere eh? and then oh, you, yeah oh yeah you're not getting away with that bro. Yeah, i don't know that shit i was like 15 <laughs> and i was like 
trying to impress the girls on there and i was like yo check this out i get in run 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 and then excuse me the guy in the green hoodie can you please get back in the <laughs> and i was like oh shit sorry green hoodie even why are you gonna bring me into disrepute oh man <laughs> i didn't want to say red or blue because you know <laughs> i don't represent the crips or the bloods okay I'm, I'm right in the middle uh who would win out of a fight uh john campbell or jack tame Oh, I'm sorry. I, I big time here go for the wisdom of the master, John Campbell. He must know some. He must know some some sweet spots to get somebody in a headlock. Oh, he's or something such like. a legend. He's such a legend. What's the first time? First time you met John Campbell, man? Were you like, holy shit? First John time Campbell. I met John Campbell, I was actually at BFM and I was wearing a <laughs> Yeezy shirt um, because I'd just gone to see Kanye in Sydney. Um, and yeah, it was it was wild because he was hitting me up all about hip hop and rap, and I was like, I I knew John Campbell was good, but I didn't know he was this much of like a patron saint of all things good. <laughs> yeah, I was I was absolutely blown away. He's, he's next level, man. That guy. Uh, here's another one from Wagga. Wagga says, uh, "Would you be happy if uh, the McGillicuddy's Serious Party came back in some form?" I think that the um, McGillicuddy Serious Party definitely had a massive impact on some of the folks who were the roots of the Greens. Uh, and yeah, I would be happy. I would be happy because I think that, um, you know, the opportunity to draw a light on just how ridiculous some of politics is and hopefully to expose a few more people to what politics can be um, would be mean. And I also just think that there's so many different ways to communicate stuff. Eh? Like um, comedy is such a, a great way to shine a light on issues that people otherwise sometimes shy away from. Yeah. Uh, Dave Chappelle's a massive, I don't know if you're a Dave Chappelle fan, but he's oh, yeah. like a pro of it, you know? Oh yeah. Man. Oh yeah, yeah. No, bro. I've recently been getting into stand-up comedy. It's been a well, it's like been a whole you thing. actually getting into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I've done two sets. Yeah, I did. Um, my uh, my guy, uh, Tim Batch, uh, set up a fundraiser gig for me. So it was a very welcoming audience. But um, we had a bunch of comics do stuff, and Corey Gonzalez McCure got a gig at uh, Ponsby Social Club, and um, I ended up doing yeah five minute set there. So I've done it twice. Um, oh absolutely terrifying if you want to put yourself outside of your comfort zone go hard <laughs> did you kill though did you get it did you, did you oh yeah it? i think i think it did all good like i think particularly the first one was like you're never going to get a more receptive audience than a bunch of people who are there to help you fundraise for your campaign but True. i think in um psc it was definitely a matter of uh having to work quite hard so I was proud of it. I was proud of it. I can definitely do better and I will be, uh, yeah. but it's something that I always wanted to tick off of the bucket list. So I'm good. Uh, another friend of yours. I went to uh, Joe Damon's uh, show. Oh, Joe. He's, he's amazing, man. That guy is. He's, he's so good. So glad that he's come up. Cause he, he used to run a magazine, right? With you. Yeah. Well, not with yeah. you, but a, yeah. Uh, In competition. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we came up together in very different ways. Um, it's been real sick watching him evolve and develop. And like the same way that we were talking about Bryson before, um, you know, now doing his mahi at Re, uh, and also the stuff that he's done with the Sweat Up Boys has just been immense. Next question. What's your go-to favorite ice cream flavor at uh, Ollie's? Used to be Goody Goody Gumdrops. I haven't been there for ages though. But yeah, Goody Goody Gumdrops was the one and then a bit of Street Fighter and whatever that zombie game is they had there. Street Fighter? Talking you're talking my language now. Who's your go-to <laughs> on the Street Fighter? Bro, I Ryan? at Neck of the Woods, I hosted um where I used to work. I hosted the Street Fighter competition yep, once. I've heard this. Oh true. Yeah, yeah, Dave, the guy that did it, he's he was like, oh he yeah, he was like, bro. Oh what, too much. What, what That's so cool. Auckland's way too small. I know. <laughs> Funny story, anyway. Before Neck of the Woods, I used to work there. I used to work at a place called RVB, which is like a gaming place before it was uh turned into Neck of the Woods. Too much. Underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like uh they just set them all up and you go in there and 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 play it was like a net cafe but for Xbox and stuff. That is so dope. Yeah, yeah there's like random um, kind of graveyard for all of these old arcade games in one of these malls along Queen Street. I found it once um, with my mate Malawan, who actually worked with Joe for a bit. Uh, and it was just this mind-blowing moment of going, 
yeah, where did all these machines go? Oh. <laughs> like they just sat up there and yeah. no one's using them. And I'm like, surely, surely there's a fundraiser in this. That place was legendary because remember you, you'd walk downstairs to and Ifans, e- e- Ifans e- is what it's called. You'd walk yeah. down to Ifans e- and then play, but then they moved it all like on the third floor down that fucking, I don't know where it was, by the subway and the lotto shop on Queen Street. Oh, true. Yeah, yeah, they moved them it's all It's all switched off now. It must be the same place. Yeah, so then they, they, then I don't know where it's gone though, but man, there was a lot of game consoles. Yeah. They would have sold those easy. I would have picked, I would have picked one of those. Like, <laughs> shit. Uh, here's another one from um, Uskar Game. He says, uh, what are some misconceptions uh, about PAPA that a lot of people, people have? People against prison. Um, I think probably, so People Against Prisons um, is a organisation that has a co-papa of basically recognising that our current criminal justice system or prison system is not working. Uh, and kind of as we were alluding to before, uh, it generally only seeks to uh, perpetuate issues of not only crime uh, and violence and victimisation, but it also doesn't do all too much in the way of rehabilitation, um, let alone um, also dealing with the issues of victims themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to ask ourselves what the purpose of prisons are, because in their current format, um, they're not really doing all too much for many people. They're not helping to reform prisoners. Um, You know, you look at the statistics, the majority of people, or actually the longer that people spend in prison, the more likely that they are to reoffend. And that only serves to perpetuate intergenerational issues, uh, but also victimization and kind of grow the bubble of problems. So um, kind of the driving kaupapa of People Against Prisons Aotearoa, uh, from my understanding, is to move towards a society with the goal that prisons, um, prisons in their current format of these kind of jail houses where people are treated like animals, do not exist. And that doesn't mean that some people aren't going to need to be uh, kept in a different place or looked after for their entire lives. Uh, But it does mean that (coughs) we do not continue to push this, kick this can further down the road uh, and not deal with what is right now not a justice system. It is a criminal system. It's not a justice system. Yeah, it's, it's interesting the differences between those two things. Oh, mate. I mean, it's like, just if we want to genuinely start thinking about how um, we unpack these issues of, uh, like, how, how do these issues come to be to begin with, right? I mean, it's like, again, right, raising people's incomes, ensuring that people have stable housing, that is not only suicide prevention, it's also crime prevention, (laughs) because people engage, and this is also one of the biggest misconceptions about the likes of crime, particularly petty crime, is that typically it ends up taking place in the same area or neighbourhoods that the perpetuators of that crime live in. And what that means is that you end up in this awful cycle where people who are disadvantaged and live in disadvantaged areas end up nicking stuff um, off of people who are their neighbours. And it only serves to make the problem worse, you know? Um, So, yeah, I mean, the the kind of co-papa, as is driving constantly, is to look at those uh, models overseas that have approached justice in a truly just way. Uh, and have sought to meaningfully rehabilitate and to ensure that victims and survivors of crime uh, feel as though they are being hurt and that there is a meaningful resolution. Um, Right now, the criminal justice system offers a binary, which is that somebody goes to jail or they don't. Great. Well, there's there's no more creative uh, solution which enables the breadth of you know human experience at like it's it's just that there is there is no capacity to meaningfully grapple with these issues there is only lock them away and throw away the key or let them out and then you know you haven't really dealt with the problem anyway instead if there was this active process of reconciliation and rehabilitation then everybody would be far better off but I mean, that's that's the robust conversation that people don't want to have, and either don't well, don't want to, or just kind of like, eh, it's fucking. Do we really need it? Is it really broken? You know? Yeah. Well, it ends up being put into this really controversial space, right? And I guess that's the thing is, 
it's all of that stuff that people say is impossible. And people, I, I just think if you're willing to really write off other human beings as inherently evil, all of those human beings who end up in these positions where they do bad things. Sure, there are people who commit very awful atrocities and it, it would be nigh on impossible uh, to forgive them. But do you want them to uh, do those things again? Do you want them to end up being better people at the end of that process? Do you want some way to... Uh, let go of that pain or to work through that pain mm. because right now our system doesn't doesn't offer that in any meaningful way we've got a uh, g- coming back to a previous thing about uh, the, the fight that's going to go down between you and david seymour uh, <laughs> live live on pay-per-view live from, on the pro vice project on the pro- <laughs> man we can get it done um <laughs> john says david does have those dance moves though <laughs> True. Yeah, he's yeah. He really did it, dedicated himself to that co Um uh, Yeah, bro. He, uh, I respect him for that. I respect anybody who um, dedicates themselves to getting a little bit embarrassed, um, but going hard. And I feel much the same about my comedy career. <laughs> oh, to ask, and this is a great question. Um, honest feelings about the new conservative party and the damage they could cause. Uh, honest feelings uh, that their uh, a lot of their policy seems to mirror um, Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> um, they, uh, I, I find it really difficult, right, when people invoke notions like Christianity to uh, justify uh, oppressing other people. Um, you know, they want to remove my right to marry the woman that I love, for example. They want to control uh, my uterus. <laughs> they want to say, uh, you know, that trans people don't exist. They want to do all of these things, uh, which we know based on evidence, but also countless anecdotes cause huge amounts of harm to people, but don't necessarily stop those things happening. Mm. So um, I... <laughs> I don't know if they're getting, I mean, maybe I'm just in my bubble, but uh, based on their polling, um, I don't I don't think that they are getting all too much traction. I am a little bit more concerned about the traction that conspiracy theories are getting right now. And I think that that is largely based on, yeah, people who feel as though they're not particularly represented right now and have been let down time and again uh, by institutions. Um, because yeah, I to- I'm totally with you on the conspiracy. Even the um, Oranga Tamariki thing that happened like a couple of days ago, I was like, fuck, like, can't be saying that because that, that brings fear into people getting tested and all of a sudden, uh, it's, you know? yeah, it's 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 gnarly. Um, and I just think it's it's so gutting because we can do better. Um, if we're not focused on shadow boxing, uh, falsity, uh, and we're focused on uh, what the evidence is and debating the reality of the situation and how we better approach it. Uh, here's one from Getting Dicey. He's a uh, Dungeons and Dragons guy. Do you ever get into the D&D? Uh, I have not, but my good friend Lewis is a um, dungeon master. And James Shaw, uh, if you Google James Shaw, who's the co-leader of the Greens and uh, Dungeons and Dragons, you will learn all about how much of a nerd he is for Dungeons and Dragons. What about, what, are, you, are you playing any uh, video games? Like, are you on the Switch? You know, you uh, on the I'm Switch? not on the Switch. I'm not on the Switch, but my partner is. Um, the Animal Switch, Crossing? You know, Animal Crossing oh, is a big yeah. one, yeah. Someone recreated the uh, Green Party sweatshirt that I always wear uh, on Animal Crossing, which was hilarious. But I, I used to be a big-time um, Xbox 360 nerd. Uh, let's let's so- speak. Let's t- oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> I'm just flagging, bro. I am going to have to go in about 10, oh, but okay, I got, um, yeah, I got a, um, I mean, I, I was mostly big on RPGs. And um, so I had a, look, I, I, you know, Bethesda, all of those uh, kind of open world sandbox games were big time for me. I dated a few boys who were into um, MMOs. So, you know, I did my fair uh, number of going and playing League of Legends at, uh, you know, uh, cafes, internet cafes. Uh, but then for me, you know, I've, I've also clocked Halo. Um, oh, multiple. flex on them. Flex. That's a big <laughs> flex right there. 
not not as much as I'd like. I gave up um, uh, my gaming career, if you could call it that. I barely ever kind of got there. But I did actually go. Um, one of my final assignments for BFM, I went to whatever that gaming forum was called that was at uh, Spark Arena. Uh, with the one that Kim.com was playing Xbox at and oh, yeah. he was challenging everyone to COD. Uh, and I remember um, reporting on that real vividly, but that was kind of when I was like, I need to get out of this world because I'm going to either have to dedicate all my life to it to feel like I'm competent enough at it to keep doing it, or I'm going to always feel pissed off that I am not as good as I want to be, uh, at which point I'd rather give up on it. <laughs> just you just you dropping COD and not Call of Duty. Oh, you get the you get the the, the gold stamp from me. <laughs> oh, oh man, I I have been to a few midnight releases in my yeah. time. So oh, that okay, too. here we go. <laughs> um, man, sheesh. Uh, what was your go to go to jump jam song? Did you do jump jam? Song? Oh my god. Um, yes, I did. Hillsborough Primary School. Um, all of those songs feel problematic. Um, looking back on them, <laughs> you know, there's like the um. The, the the song that springs to mind is the one about picking coconuts from the coconut tree, but it also yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Yo. But I'm not sure about like was there an element of cultural appropriation there? I don't know. Mm. Um, potentially, it's like the, yeah, I don't it was know. A, it was a it had the the Jamaican like drums. Yeah, <laughs> and attempted doing yeah the bongos totally. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So potentially, but that's what I remember. Um, and I very very much um, enjoyed my jump jam. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I was meaning to get on uh, getting dicey, but we went on um, we went on the D and D track, so I'll ask his question now. <coughs> and if it comes up, there we go. Uh, oh, that's the yeah. Uh, could you ever see the Nationals and Green Coalition working? Uh, it would depend on alignment of policy and of values. So one of the biggest challenges right now in attempting to work with the National Party, particularly on environmental policy, which is what I have tried to do on the Environment Select Committee when I haven't managed to get traction with the likes of Labour or New Zealand First, particularly in restoring urban tree protection um, in the RMA, uh, which, you know, subsequent to it being taken out by the former national government, which is broadly indicative of their kind of co towards the environment is that actually they will actively remove environmental protection as opposed to instigating it. Uh, but in trying to work across the aisle on that, I just saw the kinds of things that they value, which are commercial uh, profit over our environment. So um, I think that, you know, recognizing actually what the core Green Party charter is, is really valuable in helping to understand how and where we will work together. So uh, a lot of people think because our name is green and our colour is green that we're fundamentally an environmental party, but they don't recognise that there's four core pillars. So all Green parties all across the world have the same four core charter principles. What differentiates the Green Party of Aotearoa in New Zealand is recognition of Te Tiriti or Waitangi as the founding document of this country. Yeah. As we were talking about before, only party in our parliament that explicitly does. But the first one is ecological wisdom. Recognition of the fact that resources are finite. And if you accept that those resources... Are Resources, even those that regenerate, need oxygen, space and time and, you know, God forbid, some planning in order to regenerate. So if you accept that as a principle, the next one makes a whole lot of sense, which is social responsibility. Uh, if resources are finite, then you need to make sure that at the very least there is a basis of everybody having a just equal opportunity to the distribution of those resources. Uh, the third one is around appropriate decision making, and it's the kind of stuff we were talking about before with regard to local government, devolving decision making powers <coughs> down to the level where it actually affects people. Fourth one is nonviolence or peace, and that's basically about sustainable development, bring together a diversity of opinions and perspectives around the decision making table from the get go to make sure that you don't neglect someone or some perspective or some culture that ends up having to apply the system or the solution, and it obviously doesn't work for them. So if you look at all of those things in a holistic way, right now, the manifestation of the National Party, which focuses doggedly on the idea of personal responsibility, oftentimes to the exclusion of recognition of political responsibility, just does not seem viable. But again, if the National Party starts to express some care for people in the planet, 
then perhaps. But ultimately, I don't think it's about the Greens having to sacrifice their values or our values, but it should be about the Nats um, moving a bit in our direction. But the other thing that I would say, which is kind of the broad premise of this, is that I don't think that the Green Party should see themselves in perpetuity as a minor party. If you look at established MMP democracies across the world, the likes of Germany um, or other European countries, it's very unusual for one political party to get over 20%. And I envision that in a mature version of an MMP kind of environment that we will have the same. So my intention is not to continue this perpetuation which I think actually is to a certain extent a self-fulfilling prophecy by virtue of the myopic focus on who's going to be the next prime minister, uh, which neglects the fact that nobody actually elects a prime minister except for the version of cabinet that ends up being formed based on how government is formed with party, party negotiations in parliament. Yeah. So um, for me, it's about giving those equal platforms to party leaders and that kind of diffuses that self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Oh man, what a great, what a great answer. <laughs> there's a few don't it there's a few things in it but yeah. yeah but no it was it was awesome um a couple more we'll get uh halatuti asked this twice so i better get it some people compare you to aoc uh, in the in the united states how do you feel about that and do you enjoy her approaches to talk to politics uh, so I think that comparisons are an interesting one right because in much the same way that i've spoken about how you know, people look at a political party and have a semblance of an identity um, that they think that party is associated to. Um, I have had a lot of experience with trying to unpick people's preconceptions, particularly of the Greens, um, but speaking to the likes of, for example, um, you know, family members who I've spoken about tonight uh, who have certain political views that are formulated based on their identity as opposed to necessarily looking into the policies or the evidence or their values even um, has been, a, a, yeah, an interesting one for me. Mm. So um, on the AOC front, based on what I know of her, and I only know so much of her, um, I completely respect and admire her eloquence uh, and her ability to get cut through um, and her stances on things like uh, economic reform and uh, you know, environmental protection, um, active and protection. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I know that other people have their uh, kind of views of her, um, which are probably based on other assumptions and associations. Uh, so I'm always weary of saying that I'm, I'm New Zealand's equivalent of anything. I'm, I'm Chloe, so <laughs> we'll go with that. But um, yeah, broadly, based on what I know about her, I, I would be flattered by that. All right. And this is the last uh, question we have from um, the chat. Uh, what's the biggest barrier, do you think, uh, preventing Kiwis from pronouncing Māori words correctly? I think there's pro it's probably twofold. Um, one of them is uh, education, and the other one is uh, probably an insecurity, and an insecurity that manifests or is born from a few different things. Uh, born potentially from a sense of uh, being better than, uh, honouring, the Māori name um, of a place or a Māori word. Uh, it potentially is derived from only hearing um, that incorrect way of that word being said, particularly in representation in media, which is why I really admire the mahi that's been undertaken, uh, and particularly our mainstream media, to um, educate uh, announcers and show hosts uh, in how you pronounce te reo Māori. But you also saw the pushback that, you know, hosts on places like RNZ got, like Guy and Espina, for speaking um, te reo Māori, um, which is just mind-blowing, which brings me to my kind of third point, which is probably, um, yeah, to, kind of related to that first one. It's a hesitance about getting it wrong, um, but also feeling a sense of supremacy um, about who you are and what you're entitled to and not honouring tetiriti, um, mm. not honouring the whenua that you're on, um, not honouring oh. the heritage and, yeah, the taonga um, in this country. So, yeah, it's, it's multifaceted. And 
I apologize if that seems like a really convoluted and complex and nuanced answer, but I'm never really inclined to say that there's just this one simple thing because there really ever is. There's, oh, sorry. Yeah, there is. I was just like trying to trying to get like a, a great metaphor that, uh, you know, could bring all that together. But you are so right. There's so many. There's so, I think it's more like ignorance. Like people just get ignorant. They just don't want to learn it. And mm -hmm. I mean, you had a look at um, the Marcus Lush thing that he did. Oh, on, yeah. Man, that was like so cringy and so like wanted to punch a wall, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's it is actually like middle. You know how they got Middle America? It's Middle New Zealand. Like it really yeah. is. There is. I think I think there's also a lack of um, kind of recognition of the role that people with influence who hold those positions on talkback radio or as sports stars or whatever else, um, you know, if they'd have truly recognised the role that they play in shifting culture um, instead of, you know, perpetuating ignorance or sometimes belligerence <laughs> um, or bigotry, then we could end up being in a far better place. Yeah. All right. And uh, final question from me. Okay. My final question that I wanted to ask you. What's the best piece of advice that uh, Janet Fitz, uh, Fitzsimmons has passed on to you? Oh, Jeanette Fitzsimmons. Jeanette Fitzsimons. Um, sorry. Yeah. So sorry. Jeanette um, was, yeah, God, she was good. Um, just probably it was the the reflection of breathing. Like, you know, the, I, 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 I was really fortunate to have a moment um many moments over the time um, that I came into the Greens with her, whether it was at her farm in the Coromandel or when she came up to Tāmaki or in Wellington. Um, she spent the last few years of her life really trying to get arrested um, because it was kind of a goal of hers. She thought that if she got arrested trying to undertake some kaupapa, then she'd have a bigger platform to talk about the issue. And it was kind of that last rebellious streak that she never managed to quite achieve, unfortunately, before she passed. Um, but for her, it was just, she was one of the kindest um, and most pragmatic, but also uh, unassuming people that you'd ever meet. She was so deeply intelligent that she didn't, she never came across as holier than thou. So, um, yeah, it was when I felt deeply overwhelmed, she would just remind me to breathe. Yeah, that's cool. That's great. Mm. Chloe, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I know the chat, they were like, you better say thank you. And oh, of course <laughs> I'm going to say thank you. Thank you so much. This has been both educational. We've learned a little bit about yourself. I've learned a lot. And yeah, I just want to say a huge thanks. Hey? Main bro, thank you. Thank you for having me on. We need to and thank you to yeah, everyone who's been out and about. We'll just get you back on and we'll just talk about RPGs. <laughs> you got it you got it oh no absolutely i think maybe next time we properly do the twitch and i'll walk you through we'll play animal crossing live or something oh right? there we go now we can play we can play some street fighter man what do you know <laughs> done deal oh we'll just talk about hip-hop i'm like yo I'm, oh yeah we didn't even get into that i know yeah, i'll make you a playlist next time kanye is my yo kanye is my oh yeah problematic OG. face yeah <laughs> that's my guy man and you know like oh yeah anyway, oh yeah thank you so much i'm just gonna wrap it up and i'll i'll, 